Welcome back to show number 86 or so I've been told of Kevin Pollack's chat show. As always, I am chat show. How nice of you to join us here on this Halloween edition of the chat show. Are you in costume? Wait, we're not in costume. Shit. Um, we are pre-taping this show. If you're watching us live, God bless you and your family. And uh, following up on the iTunes and the various portals, welcome, won't you? Feel free to join us anytime live. It's Sunday on the uh, West Coast uh, dial, 3 p.m. Uh, do the math according to where you live. We're getting emails from all over the world now. So now I finally believe there is, in fact, something called the World Wide Web. Uh, you're not buffering. Sammy? You apparently wore a costume. What do you I mean? was not told. I did not get a memo saying that we were going to... I don't know what you're talking about. Oh. Um, this is how I always look. I should point I something out. I didn't get out. makeup before the show today. I should point something out. Uh, yeah. You're finally letting people know that you're a Jew. And uh, all Jews are vampires. You've got horns. And fangs. What? They're furry horns. What does that mean? <laughs> Uh, oh, <laughs> they are furry. Did you get those from a stripper? No, these are mine. Did, you told the furry horns are yours. They grow if I don't file them down. It's, uh, if I don't go to Shabbos services and file them down, they grow out. And so you thought you'd throw in the teeth for shits and giggles. Well, That's I, your costume. I was hungry before coming to work today, uh, but I didn't feed yet. I. Uh, this is your backstory. On a Christian baby. Look, the Jews are a... Conf <laughs> People don't know about us. And you're going to set them straight today? I hope so. All right. And Jamie, do you have Halloween plans? Uh, of course. Yeah, uh, what, what will you be doing this year? This is one. This is your favorite holiday, right? This is my favorite holiday. A uh, big group of us, we're going as the Adams Family, and I'm very excited. You're it, Uncle Fester. You should I know I am this. Uncle Fester. <laughs> and I could not be more excited about it. I have a, a light bulb that lights up when I put it in my mouth. And Emily made a great costume for you. Yeah, she Our did. very own Emily. Our very yeah. own Emily Goodwin did a she help me out with mine a little bit. Costume. I'm going to be Wednesday. You're going as Wednesday. Yeah. Can we tell the folks how you, how the difficult struggle and endless hours put into the research and, and location of your costume? I found it at my second Goodwill for eight dollars. I was very excited. Insane. <laughs> it was. I got very lucky. It was a good thing. I was having stress dreams about my costume. You were having stress dreams. Because I took it very dreams. seriously. Poor thing. J Max going to be Pugsley. Right. We got Rotman on Gomez. Rotman on Gomez and glasses. I'm taking them off. <laughs> He's going to walk around blind. Hold me, cat. It's going to be fun. And cat's going to be an awesome Morticia. Yeah. Cat's going to be the great. Oh, and everyone way. knows Elaine. Elaine's going as Grandmama, and her Travis is going as Lurch. We're all set. It's very. We're going to grow as the Adams family group. Yeah. I can't wait I'm for excited. us to get mugged. <laughs> So look for us on the Santa Monica Boulevard if you are uh, watching this uh, live. Go out, we'll see you out there tonight. Um, it's our third annual trip down Santa Monica Boulevard, and I could not be more excited, as bizarre as that may be sounding to some of you watching. It has become my favorite thing to do, and I'll tell you why. I have a birthday on Hollow's Eve Eve, the 30th, and uh, Halloween's been uh, a ridiculous part of my life since I'm a, uh, a child. Um, and then the other part is my dad and I shared a birthday, which sounds great on paper, although that would be reads great on paper. Could not suck more. Yeah, because your birthday's supposed to be your day. Mm -hmm. And I get to share mine with dad. Oh, sure. Some years we celebrate how I wanted to, but most years we just, you know, ended up with the track. Sounds like a good birthday to me. <laughs> right? The vampire well, Jew. Yeah. Well, my dad would say something touching like, Hey, Kev, remember that time I got your tricycle? Can't even do your own bits right. Can't even you do your own bits. Yeah, you're not even doing your own bits right. How does it go? My dad would say something encouraging, like, if number five comes in, you can get that tricycle you've been bitching about. Yeah! You're lucky you have me around, and I remember your entire my act for you. My favorite reason to have you around. Thank you, honey. He's doing a bit, people. I that was... is from a stand-up act like 10 years ago. <laughs> Don't let him fool you. This is not new material. I had to even help him out. And then we followed by my least favorite reason to have her around. <laughs> <laughs> back to back. Um, 
All right, so there you go. We're very excited about the Halloween, needless to say. Uh, we're also excited about a couple of other things that are, have been brewing and uh, have come to uh, fruition in some cases. Uh, we've been working on a way to answer some of your emails, along with the Ask Kevin. There's been a lot of requests for some of the uh, Kevin Paul Show swag. You, uh, you have your coffee mug and your, uh, your, uh, your uh, T-shirts that uh, we give to the gash on the uh, way out. And some of you have said, hey, what the hell? I want a Pakistani, Kevin. And we've, we've worked it out for you. Uh, there's a, uh, a store uh, icon on the KevinPollockChatShow.com website along the menu. There it is. You pull up the menu. You hit the store. And then uh, Jamie pops up to with bust my balls he and sell you a And mug. Jeremy did a good job making me look really thin with a nice big rack. Jeremy like R. Scott. <laughs> Jeremy R. Scott, our designer of our site, as well as this new page. Yes, Jamie, <laughs> in your T-shirt there, gave you a lovely rack. Yeah, because nice everyone who watches the show has no idea whether or not you're. Hey, here. what? All right. Um, and the next big news, of course, is the uh, the Amazon.com people decided to knight our show uh, and offer us up to their 78 million unique views a month or so, they say. Does that make it the Sir Kevin Pollock Chat Show? It is the Sir Kevin Pollock Chat Show. That's Wait, exactly right. Isn't it doesn't have to be Lord? Isn't that, can, if you're not British, I'm not can from, you be uh, a Sir? Uh, Britannia? I think you can be Here's Lord. why you're wrong, Sammy. Britannia. My mother's father, born and raised in Leeds, England. That makes Wait, me uh, half minutes? English on my mother's side, and I can be knighted. Thank you. Not true, but it sounds good. Uh, no, no, the backstory is true, but I don't think I can get knighted. I was just very excited. Um, but I can have my bar mitzvah revoked. Um, so, yeah, so put the Amazon page up there again. What the hell does that look like? Look at that. Oh, just Craig Ferguson is the only episode you can get. <laughs> uh, but you scroll through and you find your face. Oh, look at that. Oh, there's a whole bunch of episodes. Weird Al Yankovic, the only one whose manager emailed me saying, yeah, I don't remember Al signing a release. I showed him the copy. Served it up with some crow. Sorry? Oh. What? <laughs> Unnecessary. <laughs> um, no, I love managers. I think they're a great group of people. Oh, Kevin, I don't, your middle finger was up when you were saying My that. What? I think it was an accident. Strange. Uh -huh. I uh, like Matt Luber. Matt Luber! <laughs> that's your man. That's Kevin's My name. manager's got his own theme song, thanks to Jamie. Every time he calls, I have to hear this in the background. <laughs> Matt Luber! Yeah, nice. And he loves it. Um, He's working really hard, getting Kevin some gigs, Matt Luber! <laughs> nice! <laughs> uh, as many of you know, The uh, Littlest Suspect, my uh, most recent one-hour stand-up special, aired on the Showtime Network. And um, boy, did I enjoy all the people coming up to me on the street saying, hey, I saw your HBO special, I loved it. Did I correct him? No, I'm not stupid. Uh, anyways, a DVD dropped on the Amazon and in various places on the iTunes, and uh, we're giving away copies here on the show. And I have three winners to announce. Uh, lucky winners, I uh, tweeted, hey, it's time to give away some, uh, some free DVDs, so retweet this message and to enter to win your very own damn copy of uh, The Littlest Suspect. So we have some winners. They are at Charm City M. Congratulations. At Krista Miola. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Congratulations. And last chance to destroy someone's name at Ronnie LeClary. Because that's a name. Congratulations to all of you. Your copy of the DVD is uh, in the mail. <sighs> I'm exhausted. Anybody? What happened? Um, is it time for Ask Kevin? It is. Let's go to the questions. Ask Your question. Kevin. Look at that. We have a graphic. Mm, nice. <laughs> this one from Kevin Query. Have you ever done an impression and had that person request uh, request that you stop? No need to name names unless you just can't help it. Are there legal issues involved with impressions? Hmm. As always, woman on pause. When, woman underscore on underscore pause. Uh, A.K.A. Sarah. She must be on the tweet. Um, you know, when you get yourself a copy of The Littlest Suspect, you will hear lots of stories of me meeting some of my heroes that I've been impersonating all these years, and one in particular, not so much a recent hero, but someone that I was messing around with, Jason Statham. Although I met a British person over the last couple of days who said it's some pronounced else some other way. Let's file that under uh, on a need-to-care basis. 
And uh, so I did the Jason Statham on the show, and I haven't heard from him, although that was kind of the bit. I was expecting to get a phone call from Jason Statham at 4 o'clock. Do you know who I am? Do you fucking know who I am? What did I tell you, mate? I'm the bloke who's about your little fucking heart. Do you know what I mean? Do you fucking know what I mean? So until I hear from him, all systems go. Uh, there have not been any complaints, uh, to answer your question. Uh, next is uh, by the uh, at my underscore leisure. A lot of people are stealing it. Oh, this is in reference to uh, last show. We have a, a game here that we will be playing with my guest in about an hour when we get to him um, <laughs> called Who Tweeted? Mm. And uh, it's sweeping the nation. It's even an iPhone app. Go to the, uh, oh God, it's just one plug after a fucking another. It's ridiculous. Honestly. I did, uh, so this guy writes to us saying that someone had stolen the Who Tweeted. And he thought it was either Entertainment Tonight or uh, one of those jerks. And now he's it's writing... It's Mario Lopez. It's totally Mario Lopez. It. You cannot trust... Well, they have an Extra? Yeah. Extra. Yeah, he's on the extra. So he's, he's following up here. A lot of people are stealing it. That's what it's in reference to. I did see the TV commercial, but I couldn't remember what channel it was on. What channel? You're my father now. Here are some online versions. And then he offers them up. Uh, virginmedia.com. Uh, well, don't, don't send them to where they can see our ripped-off game. Oh, right. <laughs> there are several... Uh, Bravo TV is one of them? Sons of bitches. Uh, All right. Having invented it, I'll take the credit in saying, eh, it wasn't wholly that original. <laughs> Jamie, you invented the game for us, and you don't think it's that big a deal. That's not, I mean, come well, on. now they can use that in a court of law, that little piece of it. I mean, wait. There you go. No. Got to edit this out. Jesus. <laughs> I got to put a little... I have to put a little bit more Jew in her. <laughs> Post by the obsolete man. Last ask, Kevin, is after your deal with Fox goes through, what will be the fate of the chat show? My deal with Fox? Are they giving you $100 million to do voices on three animated shows? No. Isn't that you? No. Oh. Might, they be, might this person somehow have an inside beat on the um, new television show that I'm about to announce? Uh, is that is, possible? Is it the one, the buddy cop show? Where <laughs> no. it's you and me and we fight crime in the Midwest? It's right. No? Jew and Jewy. <laughs> yes. This season on Fox. <laughs> Thursday nights, it's Jew and Jewy. Eight o'clock. Um, I had been uh, talking about a, a thing coming up. A, I can't announce it, I can't announce it, I can't announce it, because it took forever. Which in my brain is about three weeks. From shooting to them saying, you got 13! Anyways, uh, the press release doesn't come out till this coming week, so I'm not really supposed to be talking about it. It's called the Million Dollar Money Drop, and it debuts on Fox, so I've been told, just prior to Christmas. Look for hearing all sorts of things about it in the coming weeks. But uh, I thought I would break the story here, so don't. Um, but it's really cool. I can't wait for you to see it and can't wait for you to write and tell us what you think of it. It is a spectacle of a game show that I um, am absolutely thrilled to be a part of. I'm not going to lie. I am, I am uh, uber excited in an embarrassing way. So I'm going to stop before I go any further. But look for more about it. Million Dollar Money Drop is a big hit in, in the Britain uh, about four months ago. They aired it six nights in a row and they're threatening to air this launch four nights in a row of the Million Dollar Money Drop. So look for that on Fox in, uh, in your uh, coming uh, news briefings. I think we're done plugging. If we're not, we should be. I took be. a couple sleep takes. Yeah. Did you do right. a couple sleep takes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you had a sleep take thrown at you at the Hank Azari game? Okay. They have his little cards made up where <laughs> Hank used to do the, uh, that, he would, someone would tell a story and he'd go, you know what, funny thing happened to my brother and I, <laughs> And then eventually someone had, I think it was Andrew Hill Newman actually, someone had cards, I think it was Andy, had cards made for him, it just said sleep take. Now he just tosses them at you in the game. I had two toss me last night from Michael Hesloff. I've had piles and piles thrown at me. <laughs> Sammy's been covered in them. Please. I have photographic evidence. <laughs> um, my guest today, yes that time has come. Oh, the Larry King game. Shit. Did we tell you about the Larry King game? Oh. Uh, okay, good. No. Then it's a good thing that this came up. This is the first good thing. <laughs> Every interview ends with my guests offering up their version of the Larry King game. Larry, God bless him, hell of a career, but let's face it, he's 107. It's only a matter of time before he shares something about himself on the air that none of us want to know. 
When you play the Larry King game, and this is fun to play with your friends, helps to be slightly intoxicated, I'm not going to lie. When it's your turn to play the Larry King game, three rules apply. You must do a bad Larry King impression. It takes all the pressure off having to do a good one. Bad Larry King impression. And then act out that moment where Larry loses it on the air. And then go to the phones. Name of the city, funny sounding, it's going to help. I will offer up this example from t this week's winner, Sean Wright, who on the Twitter, no, that's an email address. We don't want to give that away. All right, scroll up there, Dr. Chen, so I can read Sean Wright's Larry King game. It goes thusly. I had just emerged nude from the grotto at the Playboy Mansion after a late night dip with Marriott Hartley. I bent over to retrieve my glasses when from out of nowhere, <laughs> Brando sneaks up behind me and buggers me from behind. <laughs> Magnificent. Lochapoca, Alabama, you're on the air. <laughs> Thank you, Sean Wright, for that wonderful example of the Larry King game. T-shirt coming your way. We have your size and shipping address. Look for that. See, the obvious so, choice would have been to go with James Conn in the grotto. But yeah, you know, he went the other way. way. I like James it. Con James Conn in the grotto is like, uh, it's been overdone. You're absolutely yeah. right. Excellent yeah. point. Uh... I first became aware of our guest um, as he entered into uh, the pantheon of uh, television um, in a little-known show at the time. And then shortly after, our lives crossed uh, career paths in an absolutely surreal, bizarre way, ultimately for both of us. And it then led to our, I think, first introduction. We both went... Um, from across the room. The year? 1991. I was doing a short-lived, wrong for CBS uh, summer series called uh, Morton and Hayes, created by Christopher Guest and Rob Reiner. We did six episodes, Bob Amaral and I, this other actor, we played this 1930s comedy team, and Rob Reiner suggested he found these old two-reelers in a vault. Recently, when construction workers were tearing down a foster freeze to make room for a Dairy Queen, or vice versa, they, that's how it all started. So, while on the set of shooting these, and Christopher Guest directed most of them, it was a lot of fun. Michael McKean, with some great people. Rob Reiner, who I had lunch with every day uh, while working on this thing, waved his fabulously uh, uh, powerful uh, finger in my face and said, Looks like I'm going to direct this movie. It was a giant Broadway play called A Few Good Men. And uh, I think I've got uh, uh, Tom Cruise to play the lead. And we're going after Nicholson uh, to play Colonel Jessup. And there's this role of his cold counsel. And I am literally uh, vibrating with, is this really happening? You know how your brain leaps ahead sometimes when you're, when you're watching a story unfold on the big screen or through a novel, what have you, and you, you just like to get ahead and you're, you start to play a game show in your brain. Where is this going? So I am levitating out of the fucking seat until he gets to this line. I've got an offer out to Jason Alexander, um, but if Seinfeld gets picked up, he's not going to be available. I immediately start davening for Seinfeld's success. <laughs> Please, dear God. <laughs> now, you have to understand, to put this into historic perspective, at, the point, at that point, I believe it was called the Seinfeld Chronicles, and only four episodes aired initially. I'll be corrected in a moment. And it was on the bubble, as they say in this particular business of show, as to whether or not it was going to get picked up. It was a giant question mark. It had not been moved to Thursday night. It was barely being watched. And it was only through a struggle within the network and the studio that made it, in this case, Rob Reiner's Castle Rock, that a decision was ultimately made in the favor of my guest today and myself. I was given the keys to a, uh, a short-lived film career. <laughs> and, my, and my guest today... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it led to me doing 40 films in the 90s, believe it or not, five of which, pretty good. Um, but my uh, guest uh, was given the keys to uh, that pantheon of television that so few people have, uh, have reached. And um, I continued to celebrate both of our uh, successes as they uh, rose in, in, in their directions and have had a ridiculously special kinship in my brain and heart ever since. Please welcome Mr. Jason Alexander. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Oh, okay. No, please. It seems unnecessary. Much. Finish your thought. <laughs> <laughs> so, buddy, 
What what does this mean, Pantheon? Am I mean a, I mean a Pantheon? <laughs> yeah. Wow. You are Greek and God. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So that's how I found out. Yeah. That's it, similar to how I found out, too. Was it just four shows? Am I wrong? The si Seinfeld, no, Seinfeld Chronicles? No, Seinfeld Chronicles. I don't even think we were Chronicles for those four shows. I think Chronicles bit the dust after the pilot. I think we were just... Seinfeld. You know, we really notched it up for the four, the, the power order of four, and just went, <laughs> Seinfeld, you know, like... Colombo. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we did the pilot. The pilot was tested. Worst test results in the history of half hour television. They I said, know Jerry saved more yeah, of the saved cards. It. We got him. Well, we actually got, when we did the 100th episode, NBC printed them up and gave them to all of us. The testing cards? The testing cards, <laughs> the test results. What was your favorite? Uh, did you, anything? Uh, we, it, there was actually a thing that said, too hip, too urban, too, too, hip, too, urban, too Jewish. Sure. And I said, <laughs> was, was there a kike meter that actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 we're right on the brink. Oh, too much. You too got much. seven out of ten <laughs> too, rabbis. Too Jewy. Too Jewy. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So the pilot was was dismissed. We were all dismissed. Yeah. They said pursue other avenues, and then uh, they called us a couple of months later. I, I think, I, boy, I don't even remember anything. I think what happened is they, back then when there was only four television channels to watch, right. they would throw dead pilots on just to fill a slot. Absolutely. And I think they threw it on, and and my memory is that. Um, the writer at TV Guide went, wow, what was that? And wrote a little piece on it, and, and it sort of rekindled some interest, and then they called us back for the Power Four. For the Power Four? Yeah. And so how, how is that discussed even between your agent? Your agent goes, remember that Seinfeld thing you yeah. did? <laughs> yeah, they want to do four. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. What, do you, what does that even mean? I, uh, well, you know, the whole thing was so new to me. I had, I had been to, uh, to Hollywood, um, a couple of times with, with not very much interest or success. And right. uh, I was a New York theater guy, and they said, well, you know, you can make uh, what you would make in a year on Broadway, we can make you in four episodes. I went, sign me up, let's go. It was fun the well, first time, let's do it New again. York theater guy is one way to put it. Tony Award winner would be another. Well, that had just happened. That's yes, right, it that had. had just happened. That, 1989. True. That's true. Yeah. That's true. But then, uh, so, you know, we, we, we all came back. In fact, Julia had not done the pilot. Julia was brought back for the four. That's where she came into the game. Are we allowed to say who did the pilot? There was no, there was no Elaine in the pilot. Oh wow! It was, it was Kramer, George, Jerry, and an act, a waitress, a waitress at the coffee shop, uh, a, a very fine actress who um, uh, made the critical error of suggesting to Larry that she had, she had looked at the scenes overnight and, and made a few tweaks no. that she no. wanted to share with him. No. And um, and Pete Best said good night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, Holy shit! It kind of went that way. Uh, and then, so, Larry, uh, yeah. I have a few, a few ideas. ideas. A few ideas. A few ideas. Oh in the spirit God. of community and, and collaborate. <laughs> yeah, right. Holy shit. All right, so then you come back for the four, and it's yeah. like... Uh... The same thing. They tested those, tested like crap. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if, if all four even aired in the same time slot. I think they, they moved that around a bit. Right. And then there was this critical decision. We knew we weren't coming back in the beginning of the year. <laughs> But there was a critical decision about would they pick up 13 as a mid-season thing. And I actually, I don't know if it was that year or the following year, I had been offered, and, and he's a friend of mine, so I know he knows, um, I was the first actor offered the commish that eventually Chickless would go on and do. Wow. And, uh, and, uh, I was and the second, by be, the way. You, there you go. So you know. Were you really? Yes. There you go. <laughs> Nobody wanted Chickless. He was... <laughs> Chickless that, was nice. That bald-headed fat bastard. He, um, <laughs> He was nine, and uh, and NBC said, "Well, we're not really sure. Can we can we uh, can we tell you at this date?" And I went, "Well, they need to know by this date, you know, and uh, you know." And, and I held firm to the fact that no, you gotta you, you gotta go or or not before these guys go away, and and that kind of pushed the decision making process. And they picked up thirteen for season three. Uh, two. I guess that was season two. Technically. Yeah. Brian Cranston was here, and he spoke of a very similar situation with Breaking Bad. They mm -hmm. wanted him to screen test. The show's creator had created it yeah. with him in mind, and the network said, I'm sorry, the guy from mm -hmm. Malcolm in the what are you talking Malcolm about? In the middle. Right. He's got a screen test. And he got another thing that was offered, and his agent was able to go, we're not, he's... Yeah. Take it or leave it. Beautiful. Yeah. Love that. So that all So few moments but, uh, in yeah. life where you get leverage. There's so few, you know? And when you do, it's nice to hear about them. Yeah. I mean, it truly. Worked out well. It worked out well. But you're, you're absolutely right. No, nobody knew Seinfeld was, uh, was really on the map until the third season. Uh, and they put us on. We finally got the after cheers, the coveted after cheers slot. 
And we were holding the audience pretty well, and I think the third or fourth episode in that slot was the masturbation episode, and then from there on we were... I didn't mean to make that sound after saying <laughs> that. was probably... It shouldn't problem. come shortly yeah. after masturbation. <laughs> yeah, really, exactly. Um, uh, and then we were, we were pretty much... Uh, Dr. Chen, can you get that out of your brain? <laughs> can you just take a moment? Do you want to take a knee? Go ahead and get a squeegee and remove that last visual. Uh, <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, yeah. Um, well, there you go. And your and then, then your film career was and then I was allowed uh, to have a career. The stars, exactly. Literally allowed to have a career. I remember actually when I when I found out that I was I, I was almost disappointed because I had seen a few good men in New York, loved it. Uh, I had done a reading of the piece with right. Tom, and uh, yeah. I was grooving on it, and then it all went away. I lost another film like that too. I was uh, I was I won't say which role because I don't want to make the actor feel bad, but I was hired to do the film of Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. And uh, and that had to go away because of uh, Seinfeld. Because of that stupid, awful. So instead, I did movies with orangutans and children. Yeah. By the way, that's in the dossier here. Yeah. Of course, that's one of those phone calls yeah. that I've always been curious about. I have incredible news. I'm guessing the agent starts the conversation thusly. Got you the lead in a major motion picture. It's shooting over at so and so. It's even better story. It's an Please. even better story. Please. I, I had never thought about, you know, doing anything other than, you know, being led by the nose and being an actor. When they want to put a camera on me, great. Hire me, I'll be an actor. My agent calls, shows me the script. Dunstan checks in. I go, sweet, I've done a lot of family stuff. Yeah, I don't think so. It's fine. Cut to Peter Chernin wants to have a meeting with you. Why? This guy's running Fox. Why, why? Why does he have to have a meeting with me? He'd like to talk to you about the project. I don't want to. <laughs> There's only one wanna. way that goes. He's, I'm going to go in a room and he's going to be big and important and overwhelm me and I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to be with the orangutan and the kid. I don't want to do it. <laughs> you got to take the meeting. You got to take the meeting. It's Peter Chernin. It's Peter Chernin. So we go into the meeting. First words out of his mouth is, you are a comedy god. <laughs> <laughs> he's still a salesman. It's nice to know. At the head I, of the studio, said, he's still a salesman. I said, therefore, I can charge you more because it's a religious contribution. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he begins to tell me, you know, all the things they're going to do to the movie. The, my part is going to become this, and it's going to become this, and it's going to get that. And I said, well, that is fantastic. So uh, how much of the stuff with the kid and the monkey are you cutting out? He goes, well, no, we're not going to eliminate any of that. I said, ah. Oh. So the studio's dedicated to making a, a two-hour-plus family film. You're okay with that? Well, you know, <laughs> so I said, Mr. Chernin, look, you're very, you seem like a very nice guy. Let, let, let me help you about it. I've done a lot of these films. It's not really in the cards for me right now. I think I should like, look for another kind of material. Um, I said, y you want me to do this because you think the Seinfeld audience is going to come see it if I do it. They're not. <laughs> They're not coming. They're not going to come to see this unless they have kids. And if they have kids, y you could put, you know, Chaim Rachman in this part. It doesn't matter. <laughs> They're going to come because it's a movie with an orangutan and a kid. Have we booked him yet? By the way, hard to get Chaim. <laughs> Next week. Next uh, week. He's on the tip of everyone's tongue and a little caught in their throat. And <laughs> You had the wherewithal. To and I said that. I was just being very straight. I said, you know, you, don't, you really don't need me. I don't bring anything special to the plate for this. You know, just another guy. And uh, I thought I had a very straightforward man. <laughs> and we leave. The offer comes in, we're going to quintuple your movie quote, right. and we'd like to give you a two-year production office deal on the lot. I went, what am I, an idiot? You know, so know, I gotta, what, this is what they do. They make it fiscally irresponsible. Yeah. That's what they do. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. And, you know, and it turned out to be, I actually had a lot of fun doing it, and it turned out to be a nice film. But, you know, you, how do you nicely say, you don't need me? Yeah. Well, get you a guy, did. Get a guy for scale. You did do I that. said it, and they didn't believe it. Yeah. I've had very few opportunities where I got to say no over and over to the right person. To the right person. And all they do is back up the truck. Yeah. And they hit the number and you go, fuck. Yeah. That's yeah. the number. Yeah. I know. Um, I know. All right. So let's, um, let's take a moment back, if we may. Let me try. Uh, okay. I was very young when I thought, well, I have to, I have to change my name. Kevin Pollack is too clunky. And I was going to go with Kevin yes. Klein, and, Kevin I'm, Klein? and yeah. I'm not kidding. Really? Before there was a famous Kevin Klein, wow. in my youth, I had picked Kevin Klein because it was a family name of relatives. It's a fine name. It's Were you going K L I N E or no? With the E I. E I. Full it was, Jew. It was, Full Jew. Okay. It was. It was alliteration. Yeah. Kevin, sure. Klein. Kevin Klein. 
How is it bad? Not. But I, um, my parents are, no, 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 no. Oh, they put You're not uh, changing your no, name. No, okay. You're 10. You're not changing your name. You made it to 15. Yeah. And how did your folks react? They couldn't have given a crap one way or another. <laughs> my, um, because they just assumed it would be it, a hobby? What, I, 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 I had to join AFTRA at 15 because I was, I was in a little children's theater company doing little original musicals, and some schnorrer in the audience said, I can make a TV series out of this. And he ponied up enough money to shoot a pilot. But we had to join AFTRA. Wow. So now, you know, you have to join. You, 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 this is it, the name. It's official. Now, Greenspan, my real name, I still had playground trauma. I was a fat, schlubby kid, and it was green shit, green fuck, green <laughs> ass, green, green. But they always up. kept the green. It was always green. They were very <laughs> respectful for the green. And I, I just said, I gotta get rid of this goddamn thing. Which I one said green fuck, by thing. the way? Oh, that was uh, <laughs> that was Jim Apicelli. Um, yeah. uh, I knew it was. You him. never forget. You Piece never of forget. shit. Um, <laughs> and then, so I got there, and my, my real name is Jay, not Jason, Jay, right. which I always thought was a little small for a kid that was 400 pounds. I, it didn't feel like it's it not a full name. encompassed everything that I had to offer. Jay Scott Greenspan is my real name. Which is a beautiful name. Beautiful name. And I thought, Jason Scott. Jason Scott. That's it. Done. We're done. Goyasha. We're done talking about beautiful. this. Beautiful. I'm ready to go. Yeah. And I walk up to the counter, they go, would you like to have a, uh, a professional name? I said, yes, thank you very much, Jason Scott. And they went, they went nope, uh, gone. no, no, no good. Got one of those. They said, uh, I said, well, if I spell it differently, if I spell it with, uh, with S-K-O-T, no, that's taken. That's taken. <laughs> I actually got to, I pitched them, Jason. I spelled it like no, Raisin. Raisin. <laughs> Raisin. J-A-I. S I N S O N. I stride every day of it. No, no good and taken. I said, wow, this is a very popular name. <laughs> My father's first name is Alexander. Right. So feeling a little bit guilty about the whole thing, I wasn't changing my name legally. I was just taking a name. Yeah. But I went, what about J Jason Alexander? They went, yeah, sure. We're done. And that was it. And then uh, that happened to be the name of Jane Alexander's son, who's gone on to be a director. And he hates my balls. <laughs> <laughs> he just is not happy with me. Like Michael Keaton yeah. feels about Michael you Douglas. You betcha. That's yeah. right. Absolutely right. So that was how it all came to be at age 15. So your dad's kind of touched that you took his first he was, name. He was very pleased yeah. with it. Yeah, he, was, he thought it was a lovely gesture. And your mom's like, really? My mother went, nothing. That's exactly <laughs> right. right. You know the Jewish mom. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, came, yeah. Came out of me. You mom. came out of me. <laughs> your mom was a nurse, healthcare professional? mom was professional? A, a professional nurse, and she uh, created and ran a school of nursing in New Jersey for a while. She was a macher nurse, a big shot nurse. For a while there. Really? Still around, 90 years old, but still out there. God bless. Sharp as a tack, a very dull tack, but um, <laughs> health, I'm just going strong. My mom's hitting 80. I'm going yeah. to bring her out for you her betcha. 80th. I'm, yeah. I'm in negotiations to, to bring her out. It's a beautiful thing. Um, so, uh, that pilot aside, there's a, there's a theater a thing that, that is bubbling for you, or did it first start when you got to uh, university? D uh, my, my love of theater? Yeah. Uh, no, that started actually earlier than that. I, I, was, um, I was a fairly... Uh, uh, hey, look at me? No, I, I was the exact opposite. I was a very shy, uh, very frightened little kid. I was, I was pretty much a latchkey kid. My siblings are much older than me. I kind of grew up on my own. Both my parents worked. Uh, I was a bit of a latchkey kid. Um, uh, I, was, I was very heavy as a kid. And um, it didn't really want to be seen, and you know, and tried to avoid because when I got seen, it meant I was in trouble. Right. Hey, the fat kid! They spotted me. I'm in trouble now. So um, interesting. So I uh, I was uh, shy, and and what I got involved with was magic. Mm -hmm. I was very serious. I was starting around six, seven years old. I really got into the books, and I. I would go into New York, and there was a, a Tannen's magic shop, and there were always magicians there, and they'd show you stuff. They thought you were really serious. And, and, um, and I would perform magic, so I guess I was performing to some degree, but I, would, you know, I never talked. I, you know, I never had routines or anything. I just kind of did my things. And um, when I was a young teenager, about, and my parents, we, we always went to the theater. We loved the theater from the, from the audience side. Right. But I never thought about performing in any way. But there was a perfect storm when I was about 13 years old where um, I had gone to a, a, a sort of intensive magic camp. Magic camp? Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. 
And no, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's where all the popular kids go. And um, <laughs> no, no ass beating on the way home, no, was there? No, it's fun. Magic camp? Yeah, no, it was fun. And um, <laughs> and I I met some kids and I studied with some professionals that made me realize at that age I went I'm not good enough at this. And I'm probably not going to be good enough at this. Because my hands, I wanted to do close-up magic. My hands are quite small. They barely palm a standard playing card. Right. Um, I didn't have a lot of dexterity. They're not very nimble hands. Um, I, and I didn't really have the discipline for it. You, you really have to be even more fucked up than I was to be a really great close-up guy. Because it's a lot of hours in your room going, oh, I did, oh, oh, it's, oh, ow. So, um, Kenny, does the uh, not-so-nimble hands help you get the memory out from the... <laughs> <laughs> Should help you wipe because now it's clumsy. I'm thinking. I, I was just watching. I was in the gym today watching that great new that workout device, which is the you shake it the and they have the yeah they have the 60 models going and I feel great. I mean, are they kidding? Are, are we not catching on to this? Anyway, uh, I, but I, but I digress. So so I realized magic was was uh, in trouble for me. And we moved from one town to four towns over. And the first kids I met, in, you know, I was in the community pool, where you go you know, in the summer. And this, uh, this rather attractive girl comes up to me and she goes, Hey, do you, are you like, do you like to do theater? And I went, uh, Yes, you know, I never did if it, it leads to you. And they said, Do you sing? I went, uh, You know, kind of, a little. And they were doing a production of Sound of Music and they lost one of the kids. And they said, Would you come be in it? And I went, Yeah, okay, sure. And, uh, you know, and that was when I discovered the community of the, th you know, that, yeah. that cast community thing. And I went, this is, I got it. And then these kids used to go into New York and see shows every weekend. So I would, I would, I grew up in Jersey, so we'd go in. Was this one of the first peer groups, per mm -hmm. se? Yeah, absolutely. Huge. Absolutely. Huge, in a, big deal. In a child's and, and I was, and I was accepted. They thought it was funny. They thought it was good. And we go into New York, and on a Saturday matinee, we see uh, a very early preview of Pippin. Wow. Which is magic. Kind of rock music. I mean, what was acceptable as rock music of the day, and theater. And I went, "How do I not this? That's that's me. That's it. It's illusion. It's a big illusion. I could do that illusion." And I, next day, I was in voice classes, dance classes. I was doing everything I could get my hands on, and I went, "If it kills me, I'm getting onto the New York stage one way or the other." Right. And then it, that was it. But I have to ask, uh, as a fellow New Jersey, yes. Where in Jersey are you from? I grew up first in Maplewood, was the first town. Mm -hmm. And then the, the four towns over was Livingston, New Jersey. Yes, indeed. And Livingston. Come on, let the nice get those cards and letters coming. Yes, we lived in the, in the Jewish part of town. Mm -hmm. But, um, Sammy, you know these towns? I do know these towns. I know them well. I'm from Bergen County. Bergen County. Yeah. So, uh, Not and, quite. Uh, and I also know Tannen's Magic Shop. Tannen's Magic. Come I on. Was that the best? The best. My the father best. got me into magic when I was young. And I also have the... Yeah, we have, yeah, we yeah, have those Child-size hands. hands. Yeah, yeah. So I was Funny that the penis is so big and... and Huge. Yeah. Takes both hands just to... Well, if I want to piss. Both of mine. What's yeah. happening? Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> Kenny, <laughs> you're destroying this man. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Dr. Chen is done. Surrounded by cops. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's not might, uh, but he said something very funny. Yes, yes. Uh, it'll be in the transcripts. Um, all right, so uh, you were pretty much off to the races at that point. Yes. And um, were you, so was it just mostly school plays, or were you actually going into town to audition? I was doing that as well. I was doing school plays. I was doing community theater. I, uh, Did you go anywhere near Broadway auditions at that point? or I would Broadway? audition. I would audition, yep. Because what happened was that, that stupid little thing that made me join the union, the guy never sold it as a, as a series, but he got it on like the New York affiliate stations at oh, like 7 o'clock on a Sunday morning, you yeah. know, that kind of deal, in between Davy and Goliath and, mm. uh, you know. Uh, I never even knew that they sunrise semester or something. They were all about. Uh, oh yeah. I, as a kid, I used to. Oh, you don't remember the first time watching that thing? I go, this is great, Dave. You know, yeah. and all that shit. And they go, but Jesus, what? And I go, oh, oh, oh! <laughs> <laughs> they sucked me in. Oh! And, you know, I'm crying to my mother. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I liked. I liked the little doggy. I thought it was gonna be Sherman and Peabody. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> they snuck up on you with that show. But they aired, this thing aired. It's it, like in this slot, and then the next day, a, a management uh, children's management agency hunted me down and said, "We saw you. We'd like to wrap you." And I went, "Okay." And, then, and so I, yeah, I was up for, I, I started doing commercials. 
when I was 15. And, uh, you know, I'd go up for the, for the occasional film, and, and I'd go in for New York auditions. But Regional? I, national? What kind of commercials are you doing at that point? Uh, in my teens, the first one I ever did was a big national spot. It was, uh, I think I was 15 years old. Uh, it was for Hershey Kisses. Was it? Yeah. A Pennsylvania company? Yeah. A fine company. <laughs> uh, that was my first spot. I, you know, and I would do some regionals, some nationals. I, I actually paid for a lot of my college education off of the, off of the commercials. I was just going to say, yeah. at this point, the folks are like... Yeah, they're like, uh, yeah. This is oh, right. This is a thing. Yeah, now. it's becoming a thing. Now, at, at what age do you think the notion started to actually formulate in your mind as, well, not only is this it, but there's no falling back on anything. Oh, act this to a, will act to be. a Pippin. Th really? This was it. Yeah, this was it. There was nothing else. My mother, I worked in my mother's hospital. I had a, a series of uh, rather grisly jobs sure. <laughs> at the hospital because she wanted me to be a doctor, of course. You know, and, and, uh, I'm sorry, Jewish mother wanted her son to be a doctor? Yeah, strange. Funny right. that. Um, uh, but there was no doubt in my mind. And, and you know, th we had all the conversations of, if you're going to go to college, why don't you at least study something else? And I said, what, why? What, what, what else would I use? I, you know, I have no idea. What. I might have to portray a doctor. Mom. Yeah, That's exactly. as close as we're going exactly. to. So, no, I was, I was laser-sighted on it. So when you went to Boston U, was the thought of just a theater major? Or? That's all I was. That's I had it. to audition to get into school. Uh, you, the, the, there were several schools that uh, were part of the theater league of conservatory-based programs at universities. And, uh, Sean Connery's school was one of them? <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles Nelson Riley. And uh, is, is he in trouble? Is there a problem? <laughs> What's going on? Oh, I'm just talking to my, my book. Yeah. <laughs> he's playing some bets. I'm trying to tell a very touching story. And, <laughs> and he's dancing the, the around the Asian man. Is, he's is, dancing is, uh, around your <laughs> eye line. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm watching Ka over there. <laughs> uh, what the hell was I saying? Oh, college. Yeah, I had to audition. So I auditioned for uh, Carnegie Mellon, NYU, and Boston University, and uh, it became Boston University. But I went in as an acting major. And that was it? That was it. And what uh, plays, what shows are you doing in college at that point? Oh, well, yeah, how do they pick the shit that you do in college? Why? Right. You, you do things in college that will never come up again in life. We did Commedia dell'arte. We did the, the Cameron. <laughs> ah, fuck. That we never spent, became a series, the Cameron? We spent a month on Elizabethan dance, courtly dance steps. It's, well, what am I, in the BBC? Where am I working here? <laughs> um, we did... Uh, but do you honestly feel... Yes. Uh, ...as cliche as it sounds, more well-rounded in your um, acting education? Because I, having come from stand-up, I had zero acting yes. education. And in fact, I'm envious of the, 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 the learning of, yes. of technique. Of technique and craft. But uh, I, I will tell you, um, I, I think Boston University has a very fine program, still has a very fine program. Um, I don't personally believe, in retrospect, that a four-year university program in the arts is necessarily the best way to get trained in the arts. Um, they did nothing wrong. Uh, they exposed me to all the things that I would eventually learn to cherish. But it just, it was about rhyme or reason. So they take away everything that you kind of know how to do instinctually when you go in, and they go, it, I, the, the equivalent to me is, they go, this is a screwdriver, it screws things in. This is a nail and hammers, and it hits things in. This is a saw, it cuts things. Now go build a house. And you go, what? Uh? So they show you all these tools, but they don't, there's no methodology, there's no figuring out how to do it. And right. then you, you go into a play, and you go, what the fuck do I do now? So. Um, I, and I left there without doing my senior year because I, I was prevented from going back because I got a job the summer of my junior year and it ran over and I couldn't get back and then jobs kept coming. So I, I left Boston in worse shape than I went in because I, I right. had all these ideas but no, no method for them. Right. And I bummed around and studied with a lot of very famous teachers who were all in fine New York. but it just wasn't. And then I finally met the guy that would become my guru, who I think you know, Larry Moss. Yeah. Yeah. And Larry, I studied with Larry off and on for 14 years, and he really taught me my craft. But, uh, but it took a long time. I, I did a lot of work just going, I don't know, I don't do, know. Do you, yeah. Do you think you, um, was the Merrily We Roll Along the thing that pulled you out of school, or that was after? It, it eventually did. I did, 
<laughs> you don't have this in your little notes, I uh -huh. guarantee you. I did Harvey Weinstein's first motion picture. I'll say. He was a, buff he was a uh, concert promoter in Buffalo, New York, and he, he got together this little bit of money, and he, he, he produced a film called The Burning, which was a, a very bad, very cheap ripoff of the Friday the 13th. I'm films. sorry, the one that you and Holly Hunter did? Oh, you little bastard, you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, it says and, that you guys uh, are actually roomies we at one point, too. After yeah. this too. But, uh, but that movie uh, ran about two weeks over schedule, and, uh, and Boston went, eh, you, missed, uh, you missed a lot of work. I said, really? Because it's, it's kind of walking and talking. And I, I've been walking and talking for 20 years now. I think I could, I could catch up the two weeks of work. And they went, Plus, yeah. you're going to give me an honorary yeah. degree later. <laughs> That's, right. <laughs> That's right. You'll pay. And uh, so they said, no, take the semester off and come back next semester. And then uh, in that semester, I moved into New York, moved in platonically with Holly Hunter, uh, which means, in case you don't know what platonic is, she wouldn't fuck me. <laughs> and um, and then, uh, then in, in that period, Did she uh, show period, you with, with a real adorable lisp? <laughs> <laughs> well, she talks on one side of her mouth, you know. Because she can't hear in one ear. Is that do you, the do, do you know that? She's. De I think it's her left ear. I think she's definitely left ear. And she talks out the right side of her mouth. Because there's no reason for yeah, that. Yeah, because she can hear it better on this side. So. And there you have it. We don't need to have her on now. <clears throat> That's, wow, we just saved a bundle. Well, I've saved you so much, you have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad for bad mouth on her. You That's should. not bad mouthing her. Why no, I you? said I feel bad because I don't really particularly care for her as an really? actress. Really? What did she ever do like, to you? Exactly. Not no, her bad. work. Really? Not as a person, her work. Oh. There's, there's really? certain things about, you know, actors that just rub you the wrong way. I listen. For you, it would be... <laughs> Who rubs me the wrong way? I don't know that anybody rubs me. I, I, I'll tell you this. If, Paul, if I'm driving my car and I'm at a red light, uh -huh. and Paul Giamatti is crossing the street, <laughs> it's a <crime. laughs> It's a coin toss. <laughs> because I, I actually am a big fan, but I've had enough. <laughs> he has taken more shit away from me. He is taking food out of my children's mouths. That little fat, bald bastard. <laughs> Italian son of a bitch. He's got to go. You need to start like yeah. that. Gotta like go. It's, we have so much more in common yeah. than you know. He's yeah. got he's to go down. That's it's it. It's too much already. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If he does one more Shyamalan movie, I think the career is over. Oh. And then, then we're okay. Then we move in. Shyamalan Ding Dong is yeah. not uh, meeting expectations no. now um, walking down the memory lane of things I got have to I have to have a little bit after the no. burning I gotta have a little taste from the rink uh, working with Liza oh yeah just yeah. a little taste um, do you, do you know her uh, I've met her very very briefly in passing so no um, but you're very young at this point I was 24 yeah yeah and you get this show yeah with uh, with Cheetah Rivera and Liza Minnelli um, I will tell you this about Liza. I actually, I have, I am very fond of her, and I have nothing but uh, uh, great things to say about her. She is, I will tell you this, maybe the most generous person I've ever met. Love in my that. Life. Yeah, love I, I that. I mean, she gives away what she doesn't have. Love that. Um, funny, talented, talented beyond what people even know. Because in the safety of a rehearsal room, she would do things that were just brilliant. Wow. Um, the show that we were doing was a very not. Liza with Aziz show, and she really owned it in the rehearsal room, and then I think got a little scared of it in front of people and kind of punched it, backed up into some of the Liza stuff, and, and she was very ill at the time. We were, we, she was working with us, uh, and it, we were about eight months into, per, into performance when she entered Betty Ford for the first time, so she had a lot of, a lot of oh stuff boy. going on. But um, uh, if you know her, you love her. The, the only person she is cruel to is herself. Uh, right. She's her own worst enemy, but I, I got nothing but glowing things to say about her. She, she, I feel like I learned from her. Sure, she knows what she's doing around a piece well, of song. I'm, you know, that's I, why I wanted to ask because yeah. as a twenty-four-year-old, she's already a legend. At yeah, that you point. bet. Yeah, you bet. And uh, I don't know how many of those type of talents you had worked with up until that point. Well, I got to tell you, I, I, you know, the, I, I popped the cherry with, with Christ and Moses because Merrily We Roll Along was the two biggest names in the 20th century That's New York theater. Was it was Hal Prince and Stephen Sondheim. Right. And I, you know, I, I felt like a zit on top of a boil, you know, the entire time that I was there, just watching these guys do this. You all right thing. with that one? Is that all right? If we don't <laughs> pop the boil, it doesn't go like that. Um, so, you know, by the time I came around, now, now it's uh, John Cantor, Fred Ebb, Cheetah Rivera, Liza Minnelli, you know. I'm, uh, um, but yeah, no, it was, it, I was very much aware. I went, this is not like a person. This is, this is Garland's no. little girl, you no, know, and it's, it's a big thing. Yeah. It's a big thing. 
Um, before that or after that, that you begin the martial arts training? I started that when I was 11 years old. 11? Yeah. But as a kid, it's like a hobby. No. No. No, remember, I was getting my head handed to me a lot. So was that the impetus to... Yeah, my dad was, was, my dad was built like me. He was a little bit taller than me, but um, just a pug of a guy. But pound for pound, one of the strongest guys I've ever met. I once saw my dad, my, my mom used to dive, drive a, a 57 Dodge Dart. It's a little Sherman sure. tank. <laughs> and, and she had parked on the curb you know, one night, and we had a blizzard, one of those great Jersey blizzards, and the plows came through, and they put a wall of, of snow up against her car. And she, at that time, she was working in an emergency room, so she had to get to work. And my dad, you know, tunneled his way into the car and was trying to rock this thing. It ain't going. And I watched through the living room window as he picked that car up one end at a time, lifted it over a four-foot snowbank, and said, get the hell out of here. I went, okay, uh, don't, don't mess around with daddy. Holy yeah, shit. Yeah, he was a really strong guy. And, you know, I kept telling him, dad, they're, you know, they're beating me up. And he went, you got to go up to the biggest guy. Go up to the biggest guy and punch him right in the face. I said, I can't even reach his face. That's the, the we're talking about giant young men um, and when I was in 11th grade uh, the, the local karate school came and did a demonstration you know with with kids that were a little bit older than me but they did a demonstration of our school of martial arts and I went yeah so you're yeah. like 16 15 I was 11 then oh, I was 11. 11th grade I was 11 no I was 11 and um, and I shit. started studying and I and all I was interested in was will it work Right. I didn't want belts. I didn't want sports. I didn't want any of the. I don't need medals. Can I, can I don't I need punch trophies. Back? Can I hit and get away? Uh, and and I would stay with something and, and get all of that. And the minute that, I remember that my first style that I studied was taekwondo, and I'm, that's very good because you're using mostly legs, which is a little better reach, keep the bad guy a little further away. <clears throat> and then after about a year of this, they went. And today we're going to do kicks to the head. And I went, who the fuck am I kicking in the head unless they're already on the ground? <laughs> and I, I said, check please, and on to the next style, and then on to the next style, and then on to the next style. And then, you know, I started pulling all the good stuff out of the things I was learning and, and kind of forming my own little path. And how many years before you felt like? Um, I will tell you that I had my first, I, I've had several very dicey street encounters in my time. There's one I saw you tell on a talk show. It might have been Letterman. Which one? I think he pressed you about the story on, uh, had something to do with the subway and someone's arm was made askew. By no, you. those would be two different stories. The subway was one that I got out of by running across the tracks. <laughs> 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 because I was at the Bleecker Street stop, which w was, uh, th there were two ways to get off that platform, but I was waiting to change trains. And apparently they gate one of these exits off, and that's the one I'm hanging out at. When this gang of, I don't see black and white, everybody's green, but a, a gang of dark green people started coming <laughs> towards me. Uh, a very young guy, no, a teenage, you know, it looked like a bunch of, uh, like, a, like a, you know, like a Harlem street gang, these t very tough looking kids, and, and I just got a vibe, and I'm going, come on, don't, don't go there, they're just kids, and, and they're just kind of keep coming down this platform towards me, and about 50 feet away, I see something that looks like a gun butt in the, in the belt of one of these guys, and I went, oh, I don't, me no likey, and I, I just, there was nothing coming, and I just, phew, across the tracks to the platform on the other side, they were laughing their asses off, and I went, Hasta la vista, and right. Uh, so that was the subway thing. No, the the one that he may be talking about is um, I got jumped by a guy uh, outside of Rome, Georgia, <laughs> where I was I was there doing a, a movie, and it was a little tiny shopping area, but it was about dusk. It wasn't very populated for some reason at the time, and from nowhere a guy came out and put a gun to the back of my head, and I didn't know what it was, and I started to react to it, and and he unloaded this gun. Unfortunately, nobody was hot, but I you know. I'm sorry, unloaded the gun? Yeah, he started shooting. Sorry, he had the gun on your head. He's, what happened is, is the, 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 what you do when you, when you do that is you, you turn your head, because only the point of a gun is that, you know, it's not like a knife. So when you do that, it's already shooting over there. And then you, you hold it to you. You don't try and pull things away, you bring them to you. So I'm holding the gun close to my head, but in front of my body, and he's just trying to make a gun work. So he's going, do 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 and the gun is just unloading. And very loud, by the way. Um, yeah, I was going to say, Holly yes, Hunter's yes. death? Yeah, you should not no. be able to hear out Fortunately, of that. it was in front of my ear and not on it or not behind it. But, um, and then you're so adrenalized that, you know, it, so, he, did, he did not look very good at the end of it. But I didn't stay and take a survey of what I had done because I was already vomiting from adrenaline and, and the rush. And I just <laughs> hightailed it out of there. And, right. Yeah.
Yeah. But that's probably the one that Letterman was talking about. Well, the story that you told, I thought it was on his show, had something to do with a guy's arm bending the other way yeah, when well, you were yeah, done. Yeah, his, his, uh, with that guy, what I, what I think I know is um, I, I did smash very hard into a very locked knee, and I heard a very big crack. And um, when I, uh, the things that you do to the arm in order to get the gun away, there was a nice little crack there, and you know, and then like a finger crack as you pull the gun off the finger, and and then a little. I didn't want to hit him with my hand, so <laughs> you might have. But it, but it happened yeah. very fast, and uh, but you know, I heard a lot of a lot of bad sounds coming from him. Mm -hmm. uh, but I I, I swear it's to you, it's almost one of those ran and then and um, never his, looked back. His eye socket. Yeah, <laughs> hit me in the yeah. gun butt. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was three blocks before I realized his balls were still in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, look at that. Yeah. A parting gift. But I've, I've been very, I mean, thank God for the training, and it, it has saved my butt a couple times. But, um, you know, a lot of it is just dumb luck. And, and thank God, nothing since Seinfeld. Celebrity has a nice little veneer of protection. Because I always think, if a guy comes up to go, I will fuck you. George, I think, I think that's what. Yeah, yeah, George. Yeah, you don't want to kill me. Yeah. I made you laugh. Yeah, and if he's if he goes, were you in sideways? Yes, I'm Paul Giamatti. I'll go there too. I'll go there. It doesn't matter. Suddenly, he's my fat, my favorite person. Yeah. Uh, um, I actually love you, Paul Giamatti. It's just you've taken work from me. Oh yeah, no, it's mutual. He's actually a very nice guy. He's a wonderful guy. I wish and, he wasn't. Then he, I could really yeah. Hate it, him. There was just something about being uh, the, the the leapfrogging. Yeah, that, that was the you know. Yeah. He was, uh, he was that back there eating my crumbs, and then I called him and said, yeah. why did I not? Yeah. 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 Um, all right, so on your way to uh, NBC Thursday night, yes. before they offer up a show called ER, yeah. you get a chance to do one for CBS yeah. with Elliot Gould, right. who's one of my all-time favorites growing up. To see him in MASH, and to see him in Bob and Carol, and Ted and Alice, and... Just an astounding actor in terms of mesmerizing as a fan. Mm -hmm. And then you meet him in person, and there's this whole other energy that pretty much freaked me out. So I was curious what your experience was like. A gentle soul and a, and a big-hearted guy is what I took away yeah. from it, but yeah. I didn't work with him. I, uh... I've never understood anything Elliot's ever said to me. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's the <laughs> most bizarre. Yeah, and, you know... Uh, we would rehearse a scene, and you know he'd go, "That was very lateral." And I and I would and I'd give him, "Uh huh, yeah." And after three episodes, when I finally the curse was off, I went, "What the hell are you talking about? Did you like it? Is it good? Is it going where you want to go?" Uh, he he's sweet, yeah. Um, uh, very bad gambler, very bad, very big bad. and bad. Yeah, you know, speaks his own language. Yeah, uh, would bet on anything, anything. You witnessed this first hand, did you? Yeah, yeah. He, went, he said, $20, the next person comes to the door is a man or a woman, you pick. If you're wrong, I win. Really? That's what you want to do with your time? Okay. <laughs> um, you know, it was that. Um, but yeah, it, uh, charming and, and just foggy. I couldn't really get... Yeah. It was I the foggy thing. I couldn't get a thing. real connection with him because it was, it was just... I wasn't always sure he was in the room with me. Right. Um, and I was much happier to be with Mary McDonald. A little bit. She's quite, uh, quite an attractive woman. Hello. Yeah. Um, and Clooney, Clooney, that was where I met Clooney. That, he was a uh, regular on that show. He was on the first ER on CBS. Yeah, and then became a part Before of the, the NBC ER. end. Yeah, it did so well for him uh -huh. that they put him on another one. Yeah. Yeah, no, Les Moonves was a very big fan of his and kept him pretty much under contract through, I think, 15 failed pilots. Yeah. Always. You always knew, though, when you were looking at George, that the, it, it, he had a thing. I mean, you know, he was, he was a charming guy he hadn't quite grown into the face yet right. you know it was not quite he, he was he was a good looking kid but he wasn't what he became which was a really really very attractive man um and he was he kept reaching for stuff with right. his with his talent yeah you know he would try very hard and all of a sudden he hit about 35 and he went i'm just going to talk right here <laughs> yes i'm just going to do this there was a lot of effort and then yeah. the effort stopped and you yeah. went holy shit he's Cary grant yeah yeah and, that, and it was brilliant. I mean, the minute I saw him in the pilot of the second ER, I went, holy crap, George became who he is. He learned to just do yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. It says on your chart that you've... <laughs> and then that's over. That's it. Yeah. That's all you need. 
Smart boy. We uh, have a, uh, a live audience most shows. I really? mentioned that we had to pre-tape this, yeah. so I asked ahead of time on the Twitter. I, I noticed that. We have to pre-tape. Yeah. I'm going to need some questions. So I'd like to allow our audience to step forward if you don't mind. All right. Um, clearly that was for the director. Don't ask that. <laughs> clearly that was for the director. Don't ask that. Okay. All right. Why are you reading these things aloud? But because there was a note for you. No, 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 no. But you did. He did direct Criminal Minds. Oh, he did. See, now yes. I got confused because I'm sorry. No, no, I got it's all right. Confused it's because okay. that, you said there was a director by that name, and then somebody asked a question about you directing well, an episode. Well, there is, but I am also. Oh, I have that's screwed him fault. both in SAG and the DJ. Well, that, please, well, that's a very good question. So please ask. Yes. No, it is. All that's right. why. That's the only reason I read that because yeah. it is a very good question. We have, I, we have agents, I I, agents listen, in here. Uh, Someone must have brought in a... Uh, yeah, I I've had it. a lovely ginger tea with with spider egg. I don't know what the... <laughs> something in here. Um, something but lame. you started directing, actually, uh, uh, TV, uh, 1992, the first episode of Seinfeld you directed, according Did to I do the dossier. That yeah. Wow, okay. Uh, had you directed theater prior to that, 92? Yes. I yes. figured as much. Not professionally. Right, but, but, uh, uh, but just I telling don't. other actors what to do yes. while you were working with them. Wow, <laughs> as it were. I mean, you know, At the level point. of people I was working with needed a little guidance. <laughs> yes, Holly Hunter. You know. uh, it comes to mind. Yeah. Uh, so this one comes to at from at Sky Lemming on the Twitter. That's not the real name, but that's sure. Okay. You directed Criminal Minds last year. Did yes. you enjoy working on such a heavy and dark drama? Will you do more? Uh, I loved it. I, I had a, I actually I appeared in one and then I directed one and Joe I Montana. had a great time both times. Joe oh my Prince, yeah. a Prince. Yeah. And actually, that whole cast is very cool. Um, and what I love about Criminal Minds is, uh, though it is a procedural show, they are a little more character focused right. than the other procedurals, and they don't have a set style of how they do stuff. So any given director can come on and go, I'd kind of like to try something where we shoot it like this. Great! Uh, a guy named Ed Bernero runs that show, and he's very open to ideas and energy, and, you know, once you get the job, he goes, we're here to support you. Do it. Take the show where you want to go. So um, I, I got to do a lot of really interesting things in that show that were not necessarily in the script. The, the plot was about a... Um, what, what you think is going on is there's a serial killing team where this young girl is luring frat boys into sexual situations, and then somehow they're winding up anally raped by a man and, and killed. So you're looking for a team, but what it turns out to be is a, uh, a, a young man with split personality issues and his alter ego is a woman. So he actually is dressing as a woman and luring these guys in and then reverting. And when is that on? <laughs> I think you can Hulu it. Um, <laughs> I'm Huluing it right yes, now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, can you Hulu for me, will you? But you know, it, it was one of those things where, where uh, in the script I went, so he's dressed as the woman, and he lures the men, and, and then, but then in this woman guise, because that's the aggressor persona, is the woman, he rapes them with a penis. So does he ever like look at himself and have like a psychic rift to go, I'm a woman, but I, I said, how does that work? So I said to them, so what he sees in the mirror is never the thing he needs to see. And they went, that's right. And I went, well, then I want to do reflections all over the show. Well, talk about complicating a TV show, because the minute you go, I want to do reflections, mirrors and things that reflect, oh, you complicate the world. Yeah. And they went, great. Great. The I DP added went, a, whoa, whoa. No, he loved it. He went, loved the challenge. And, you know, I added a, uh, a very long, almost 90 second special effects shot that must have notched the budget up another hundred grand. And they went, great. Love it. So it was great. It was great. How that fantastic. was a great time. Um, I would love to go back. I, you know, I, um, uh, they talked about it for a little while. There's a, listen, you know, I'm, I'm new to television directing, so there's a list, and I'm about 100 down. You on also the list, went over you know. budget, so there. Yeah. I didn't go over I'm budget. Just <laughs> <laughs> you, just, <laughs> you just said 90 seconds to cost him another 100 no, G's. No, I wow, asked very nicely. <laughs> I said I'll lower my fee. Uh huh. Um, so I'd love to go back, but uh, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? You know, know, that's how those things that's are. That's how it is. Uh, we do another thing on the show. That's it? One question? Yeah. Well, that was the whole question? Just from that person, that was their You question. had, uh, uh, from out there, you were out there a week going, questions for Jason Alexander. Oh, One no, thing have, about we directing have more. criminal... We have more. 
One of the forms of questions that are asked, though, I was saying yes. on the show, yes. aren't just straight questions. Straight. They are called Tweet Five. Tweet Five. Tweet Five. Tweet Five forever now. And a T5 is rapid fire, Coke or Pepsi, no wrong answer. It's this or that. Right. And they're, they're, they're designed for the guest. This one comes to us from at Teliad, Teliad Nam, closely. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld or Larry David? Uh, Larry David. Gargoyle, gargoyles or ducks? Ducks. Catbird or dogbird? Catbird. Cosmo Kramer or Kenny Kramer? Kenny Kramer. McDonald's or KFC? KFC. You got all those correct. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's absolutely right. <laughs> it's interesting how they touched into certain yeah. things in the... So I right? Yeah. They do their own... Somehow, <laughs> by choosing Larry David over Jerry Seinfeld, I have fucked myself for the rest of my life. <laughs> there was no way to win that one. No. There was no way to win that one. Landmine or shot through the head with an arrow. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> how would you like to die, sir? Yeah, right. We have two opportunities. Yeah. And they both kill you. Um... When you went in initially on uh, on the Seinfeld show, yes. uh, in, in, I'm assuming you auditioned for the pilot. I most certainly did. How soon after did you find out, or was it during the auditioning process, no. that Costanza I... was Larry David? Oh, that he was Larry David. Right. Oh, I didn't know that until episodes in. Right. Um, I don't know that Larry knew that. I, I, you know, I think initially the reason the character is called Costanza, I b believe, I'm probably wrong about all this stuff. Um, Jerry did have a friend growing up named Bob, um, I don't know if it was Bobby, but Costanzo, um, you know, who was, you know, kind of his sidekick, I guess, as a kid. So he always liked the name. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody thought it was, it was Larry, per se, but a lot of the episodes came out of Larry's notebook of stuff that happened to him. So, you know, he was writing about things that were happening to him. And I cannot remember the episode, but it was four or five, six in... And we did the table read, and I went to Larry, and I said, Larry, you, you got to help me with this one, man, because this, A, this would never happen to anybody. <laughs> it but, took six but, episodes for yeah, you to say that? But, but secondly, <laughs> if, if it did, no one would react like this. So what do you think? What, what's your thinking? <laughs> so fucking true. And he goes, what are you talking about? This happened to me. It's exactly what I did. And I went, oh, oh. <laughs> and we never spoke about it. I just went, because up until that moment, my role model for George was Woody Allen. And if you look at the first three episodes, I'm doing almost a, almost, you know, if, if I had red curly hair, it would have been blatant, you know. But <laughs> right. I, I, it's so much an homage to Woody Allen because I didn't know where else to go with it. Right. And right after that episode, I went, oh, I'm going to start, I got to start watching this guy. I got to pick up his things. And I started just incorporating as much of Larry into choices as I could. And I, I think it, it became a tacit understanding that that's what was going on. But we never spoke about it when right. we were doing the show. After that point? It wasn't until, we, until I did the first episode of Curb that I was on that he went, yeah, you were doing me. And I, you know, that's the first time we actually talked about it. And the show had been off the air for a while already. So That's remarkable. Yeah. So for a very long time, you knew... I knew, and I'm sure he knew. The audience. Yeah, I think he knew too, but we just never, we never had that conversation. I wonder if at one point he, it clicked in for him saying, now he gets it, now he's doing it. Oh, you me. bet, you bet. It must have. You bet, because also he began to write for me in a way that he was so comfortable with, because I, now I got the rhythms. He would, he would write things like, here's what it would say on the page, no hand, no hand. And I would go, no hand, no hand. Hand. <laughs> and he would go, oh, it has to be no hand, no hand. And I, I would go, what is that? What is that reading? I don't understand that. What are you playing? He goes, that's just what it is. That's how it has to be read. And I go, no hand, no hand. And I go, all right. <laughs> you know, and as I started to understand, just watch him, that's how he does things. Then when he wrote stuff like that, I mean, I ate it up with a spoon. So he would, he, now he knew right. he could put himself you know, really into the writing of that character. And I would never a, question it. So you know. opened up a floodgate. But I possibly, I, but you know, we all did. Michael did the same thing with Kramer. You know, he, Michael once said to me, I, I said to Michael in the fourth year, I said, you have really, you've done something with this character that is, uh, is so golden. What did you do? Because I know he was struggling with it up front. And he said, they wrote the dumbest guy in the room. 
but I, that was, I, I don't know how to play that in any kind of interesting way. So I made him the smartest guy in the room. Holy shit. And I went, oh, that's so good. That's so right. Sure you did. That's exactly what you did. You made him smarter than everybody else. But what he's, you know, what he's proselytizing makes no sense. That's right. brilliant. And, and Michael began to show, as, as you should on any series. I mean, if you're not collaborating with the writers in some degree, even if it's tacit, you've got a problem. But he showed them how to write that character. Because they, they were writing a guy that Chris Lloyd could have played on Taxi. I mean, it was that same kind of, it's the dumb guy, you know, the eccentric dumb guy. And he, he showed them eccentric where the Eccentric dumb guy. Was. That yeah. really was the difference, of course. Yeah. Um, we're going to jump all around. Okay. Uh, it's one thing to be in a hit show. It's one thing to end up on the cover of Rolling Stone. Um, but it's quite rare for a show to create a generation of fans who have a shorthand with each other that is made up of quotes from the show. Right. I've never met anyone, quite frankly, uh, other than the people who worked on Seinfeld. Because for me, it's either Seinfeld or The Simpsons, mm -hmm. truly, mm -hmm. and those aren't people right. as much as I <laughs> as much as I know in terms of they do they are, but they look like this. <laughs> yeah, very, I mean, when I'm at Hank, yeah. when I'm hanging around Hank, he doesn't know the show. Right. He's not even a fan, and and it took a while because Jamie's a ridiculous fan of that yeah. show as well. And it took a while for for her, her to realize and me hearing her realizing that you know what the problem here is that he's just not a fan. He doesn't even watch. He doesn't even. He doesn't understand. Well, so my problem is, is I speak in it so much, like as my normal, like for, you know, like my friend. Like, I just say Simpson quotes, and that's how I talk sometimes. Right. And I have to realize, like, I can't do that around them. Yeah. Like I, yeah, I, like I one time, like we were at a buffet together, and he, he, I was eating something, and he asked me a question. I said, "Can't talk eating," and I'm like, "Oh no." Yeah. Like, and I'm like, "But this is how I speak. Like I speak in Simpson." Did you? My first question is before I go to these two for their one of their favorite quotes from the show. So, yeah. so think of that. Did you have a, a, a certain verbiage that you might have shared with a friend growing up? Because my best friend growing up and I spoke in quotes from movies without question. If, if, in other words, if something happened, somebody dropped their yeah. pen and it reminds you of a moment in the Dirty Dozen, you went, Schlossberger's here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever yeah, yeah. it was. Yeah. Uh, I know what you're saying. Uh, the, the, uh, the thing that I was geeked out on, and you of course will appreciate this, was the original Star Trek series. Right. Um, there was a time where I could go line by line through all 72, 73 episodes of that, of that show. Um, so there were a lot of those references. And I fell in love with my wife on our third date when somehow we were talking about, you know, secret codes we used to have as kids. And I, and I said, oh, you mean like uh, King to King's level four? And she went, oh, Bishop to Queen's level two. And I went, I love you! <laughs> you know? Because she knew that exact reference and, and had the line in her pocket. And I went, oh, this is my girl. Right. So because of that, you can appreciate. Sure. Yeah, it totally makes sense yes. to you. Yes, yes, That there's a whole generation that grew up with I this. I get it. Yeah. I get it. You're a freak spot. A freak. <laughs> you belong in the circus right next to the dog-faced boy. I'll take that to yeah. my grave. Risk. Risk. Is our business. <laughs> That's what the Starship's all about. That's why we're aboard her. <laughs> you betcha. Yeah. Right there with you, brother. Um, all right. Sammy? Yes, sir. I'll allow you to go first. Oh, for. for I'm just looking for one of your favorite quotes. It'll have to be the favorite. All right. A, um, I always loved any time uh, George would call Jerry in a panic, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when he was stuck under the desk. Where he was napping, mm -hmm. you know. Time runners here. You gotta call in a bomb threat. Uh huh. And we have a huge rant. And then Jerry, would, who is this? <laughs> <laughs> if I don't do that with my father or brother, oh, the at Jack least Benny, once a the week, old Jack Benny. Yeah. Who is this? Yeah. It's not a. It's not a full week. Sure. Every week. Every at least once a week. Yeah. With a family member. Wow. It, the, it creates a kinship, like you felt with your your. You uh, betcha. Your wife and and honey, you did one for me earlier, and I begged you to repeat it. Do you have it in you? No, I do. Because it really is extraordinary. I was talking to my eldest sister, and her favorite moment, she uh, she loves any reference to Del Boca Vista, but <laughs> we love Frank Costanza. Yeah, you bet. And when he calls up, where he's like, Morty Seinfeld, Frank Costanza. 
You think you can keep us out of Del Boca Vista? We're moving in lock, stock, and barrel. We're gonna be all over the shuffleboard court, the clubhouse. You think you can keep us out of there? <laughs> right? Bravo. Not bad. Bravo. Not bad. In fine stiller form. Yeah. <laughs> um, no gritting. Just that's what yeah. I love. Like Morty, Frank. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no gritting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How fun is, was that to play with? Uh... Unbelievable. With with Jerry? Yeah. S Stiller? Yeah. Oh, have it. You know he's the third guy to play my dad. Right. So give us a little bit um, of that. The first guy. To, I can't even remember the first guy. I'm, I'm sorry to say. He, he, was it just the pilot? Was it just the first? No, story? no. It was. It was no. It was into some episodes. Um, they established mom for the masturbation show. Established mom. Right. That was her first appearance, and then you know Estelle scored so big. They went, oh, this is we got to get. She's got to come back, now. and we need the dad. And they hired a guy, and and that it was just not memorable. And then they hired. Um, a wonderful actor who I'd worked with in New York on, in Broadway Bound, a guy named John Randolph. Oh, wow. Wonderful character actor. Love but, John Randolph. But John, uh, he was like my grandfather. Yeah, he I mean, played you know. Nicholson's father in Preacy's <laughs> exactly. Honor. He can't be your exactly. father. Exactly. It just, it was the wrong casting. Yeah. Uh, and then finally Jerry Stiller came in, and, and before we went into, before we wrapped the show forever, they went back to the episodes Stiller wasn't in and reshot those scenes with him so that in syndication he would be the guy all the time. What? Yeah, it's pretty wild. How many years back? I have yeah, no idea. Several. <laughs> several. You know, it was, it was only a couple of shots scenes. here and there just to do some scenes Pickup and shots. make sure that he was the guy all the way. So I've never um, heard of that being done before. Yeah. Wow. That's outrageous. Yeah, was, and it, fantastic. It was, yeah, it was great. It was great. Um, Jerry was, listen, he came in, uh, first of all, uh, you know, you and I grew up, Stiller and Mira, The Sullivan Show. I mean, come on. And, and I had followed some of Stiller's theatrical career. I saw him and Ann do Prisoner of Second Avenue with the Paper Mill Playhouse in New Jersey. Oh. They were killer, killer oh. funny. I saw him do um, uh, Hurley Burley in New York. Uh, I had actually seen him do some Shakespeare work. He was quite, uh, quite a good classical actor. And they said, Jerry Stiller's coming in. I went, oh. And then he's everything you want him to be. He is sweet and kind and grateful and, you know, and... Um, so kind that I said to him, Jerry, you got to do it. There's a thing that I that I found with you know one of the other actors that's really fun, where you just hit me in the head. You just take your hand and just hit me in the forehead. You know when you get frustrated, and he he said, I can't. I'll hurt you. I can't. I said, You're not going to hurt me. It's my forehead. You're not going to hurt me. And I said, And don't freak out because I'm standing right by this door. So when you do it, I'm going to smack my head into the door. And, he, and you know, and he just it took everything he had to do that kind of stuff because he was such a gentle man. Right. But he, you could not. The Del Boca Vista. Have you ever seen the outtakes of him trying to get that phrase out of his mouth? Oh, yes. It was an hour. He could not get Del Boca Vista out of his mouth. And it's, you're telling me there's not one vacancy in Bell Conte? You know, over and over and over and over. The whole Frank Costanza milieu. Yeah. Is, is Jerry Stiller remembering his lines about three and four words at a time. Exactly. There was a stilted energy yeah. that was so he, consistent. He would begin it, and he wasn't sure where it was going, and then it would, and he would get scared and frustrated. And, and so the, the, the sort of all of a sudden hostile reading came out of not of him making a choice. It came out of his frustration with himself. And he couldn't remember. Yeah. How do you... Have the nerve! <laughs> you know, and, he, and he still doesn't know where he's going. So he's, it's just this, it, it's this psychotic, desperate grab for the next four words that fueled that character. It was just heaven. heaven. I, I uh, had an instinct about that. One of the very first times I saw him in the role. Because I had worked with actors that had that yeah. same sort of problem. And then decided to use it as opposed to, I need another one. Mm -hmm. But I can't imagine it becoming a regular thing, season after season, year Fantastic. after year. Fantastic. Where it becomes like a, and, a and, dance partner. And Dreyfus could not get through any scene with him. She would go down like a, like a ton of bricks. <laughs> she just, she You so, want a piece of me? Oh, that, I want the whole another, That's thing. another out there. That's another <laughs> out there where they only show you, I think, 20 minutes of what was an hour of trying to get through one line. One <laughs> line, where all he was saying to her is, you want a piece of me? And she's, she cannot, she can't hold it together. Have you she ever watched the, because I know you have the complete set. Have you ever spent time with the outtakes? No, but they did like on a couple clip 
shows in, they show the yeah, outtakes. Yeah, because I remember that those one outtakes. And the Del Boca yeah. Vista yeah. one. Yeah. Uh, oh, oh, I think on that there. might have been like in the finale. Yeah, uh, yeah that big clip show. Yeah, there. Big but clip the, show. the DVDs have the outtakes from every season. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, well, then let's talk a little about that moment when you cross from. Because these are the sort of uh, the actor's life stuff that that yeah. that I I I do find um, to be insightful in terms of people getting a grasp on uh, on the ebb and flow of things of one's life, one's career. So the show's an iffy. It's a maybe. It's a thing. We're going to move. It moves to Thursday night. Well, you're after Cheers. Now you've got the whole uh, bank of agents and. Uh, and representatives, I imagine, coming forward saying, well, you know what this means. You follow Cheers, you're a made man. What I love about our business is that the way everyone guarantees us, and as a Jew, that immediately jinx everything. Right, of course. And you want to of stop course. talking. Yeah. Don't tell me how many years we're going to run now and how much I'm going to make. Mm -hmm. Stop it. They can't help themselves. Mm -hmm. and, the, and so, but, but there has to be a sense of you're going to follow Cheers now. So whatever it is we've been doing, I talk, I talk mentioned the, that sense of being knighted by an entity. You've been knighted the show, the struggling show, we can do it, we can do it, is now knighted by the network saying, we're going to give you the coveted spot mm -hmm. following Cheers. Right. Are you, uh, at that point, shooting shows when that comes down, or are you gearing up to mm -hmm. start? So you're in the middle of the process of making mm -hmm. the show. When the word comes down, they're moving us to after cheers. Right. What does that do to the energy? I mean, I can assume till the cows come home. Well, remember, you're working with a group of predominantly Jews. Mm -hmm. So we went, well, we're dead. <laughs> That's what I was hoping you'd say. We're dead. We're fucked. We're dead. You can't possibly succeed. We're going to be a giant... Hindenburg, we, we we're going down. We can't hold their numbers. Nothing can hold their numbers. There's 27 people watching this show. What, what are they thinking? How do you go from cheers and that sensibility to us, to ER, or whatever the hell was on it Catastrophe. We went, we're, well, that's it. Okay. All right, so Why don't you just this will be it. Head? Yeah, this will be it. It was fun. Oh, that's beautiful. How beautifully wrong. Yeah. Oh, I love that that's the instant. And by the way, you know, so I think it was season three that we went on after Cheers. <clears throat> it wasn't until seeing it, season six that we went, I guess we're okay. <laughs> People forget we, the histrionics uh, you know, of it. So you're saying there was a couple of years there where you well, followed Cheers with like, you're doing fine. You're not, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be We had already okay. become that show. We had already done the Rolling Stone cover. We were already, but I went, I guess, I guess we're, we're a pretty big hit. I, the, the, the thing that I always say was, was, Either I was oblivious, which is possible, um, or um, there was a kind of a wonderful innocence on the, on the stage. Right. We we never didn't quite, want to buy your own crap. We didn't quite feel inside those walls what everybody was saying, was saying out there. Right. We were just doing our little show. Right. And um, entertaining yourselves. Entertaining us. Jerry once had the best description of us. He said, "We're the world's." We're the world's biggest garage band. It's four schmucks in the garage going twang, 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 but the neighborhood's going, you know, these guys aren't bad. Uh, you know, it's yeah. just that. But if you're in the garage, you don't know that the neighbors are going, hey, they're not bad. So we, we, we knew we had some job security after season four. Right. But we didn't think we were all that, you know, and, and, and something else, you know. But someone's in your face, representatives, people are constantly have to be in your face telling you where you are in the standings. Of the business, uh, I, no, I didn't really have that. I mean, my uh, I I had <laughs> I was at William Morris during the Seinfeld years, and my uh, responsible agent was this wonderful woman, Ames Cushing, who <laughs> is, is if she was British, it would have been wonderful, but, but just you know, a very tight laced, very gracious wasp mm. is what she was, and she's not going to go. Well, we got them by the short hairs. We got no. There was none of that. I had none of that. She was like, "Isn't it lovely? Isn't success lovely?" There's some people who'd like to meet you, you know. And I, I never got that feeling of, "Oh, baby, I'm, I'm, you know, yeah, I'm a guided missile going all the way." I never had. I never felt that. I well, never felt that. That's extraordinary. Yeah, and it's probably a great. Well, I think it was a great thing for the show because right. if if you we if we had really gone, yeah. we are the shit. I think it would have screwed us up. We right. had to be the underdog. We were much better as an underdog than we were as as King of the Hill. 
Right. Because um, as the underdog, you know, you don't worry. You go, we're going to make ourselves laugh. If they like it, they like it. If not, we're out of here. Yeah. So that was a, I think that was a great attitude that, that got us through, I, you know, most of the nine years. We are uh, sitting here. I I'm, I'm imagine while you're watching, if you're watching Sunday Live, there's been a, a few, one more uh, World Series game. There's a game Saturday, tomorrow. It's a game Saturday and one on But I don't want to confuse the them as they go back in time if they're watching on Sunday. So I don't know what happened yesterday, Saturday, but the Giants are up two games to nil as we sit here. And I feel the same thing about a team who is ragtag and they don't really know why they're ki killing right. as much as we're just out there trying to hit the ball and having fun and, and being playing our game yeah yeah because no one knows how they're accomplishing what they're accomplishing that's what i understand and i follow nothing but right but I, but there must have been a sense of well let's talk about the the recognition factor because you know what it's like to walk down the streets of new york all the years that you live there and there's a there's a, a sense of I you blend in yeah. among um, millions of people on the street, and then there's that one New York fan who seems to have a bullhorn in their throat. <laughs> and it's the great Woody Allen, it's Alvy Singer right. over here. I'm sad. Right. Um, but in Los Angeles, it, there's a different thing, mm -hmm. uh, a different vibe right. in terms of celebrity and, and stardom. Is there a sense once you leave the soundstage as the show is progressing into season four and five with popularity and working its way in the top ten, is there a sense of, and I don't just mean Mater D's saying right this way, sir, but mm -hmm. rather people treat you differently. It happens almost immediately I'll if tell you they the, decide. Yeah. I'll tell you the weird stuff. I, I, there were a couple of weird incidents along the way where I just would look at my wife, Dana, and go, I need a reality check. In the third season, Mm -hmm. So we're just, we, we have, now we're on after Cheers, the masturbation thing is gone. We're, we're having a good season. And I get my first Entertainment Tonight profile. <laughs> so I'm out with them on the streets around my house, and we're just doing the B-roll thing. So there's no sound. We're just yakking, and they're shooting right. us walking down the street. And I believe that the Seinfeld show is a show for men roughly 20 to 32 years old. Everybody else, there's nothing there for them. Mm. Nothing. And we're walking down the street, and this minivan goes by, and there's a black family in the minivan, and this little girl, I imagine is about eight or nine years old, rolls down the window and goes, I love you, George! And I went, what the hell is she watching? Wow. What could we be doing that would hold her attention for a second? Wow. And then it was That's huge. senior citizens. And then it was letters started coming from outside the country. And then, I, and, and I went, how is this, this possible? This show can't speak to these people. This, this is about four urban, selfish Jews in exactly 1992, 93. And if you don't live in New York as a Jew in 1993, this show has nothing to say to you. Wrong. Wrong. That, that was the first one. The second one came where I had worked for Neil Simon. I had done a show yeah. on Broadway, Neil Simon's show, original cast. We had a lovely time, but I never, you know, I, he's a very busy man. He's writing the play. I'm one of several people. We didn't have like a kinship. Suddenly, I get an invitation to Neil Simon's 65th birthday party at his home. <laughs> and I look at my wife and I go, well, I have to assume that if you ever you know, saw his name on a marquee, you've been invited to this party. This is going to be May. There's going to be 5,000 people there. And we get to this party, and I've, you know, I don't even know. I think I got a key ring with, with an N on it. I, what do you get, Neil Simon? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. So we go to this party, and there are 40 people there. I'm the only one I've never heard of. It is, it is Carson, Goldie Hawn, Chevy Chase, Steve Martin. It's Doc fucking Simon. It's, right? And I, and I now feel like, uh, uh, <laughs> I think they sent the, <laughs> the invitation to the wrong you address. Help park cars. And if I tell you, from the moment I walked in the door, Neil never left my side. He wanted to hear about the show. He wanted to know about the show. Carson, who I'm so intimidated by, I, you know, I'm walking by to get an hors d'oeuvre three times. I don't want to say anything. He's sitting on the couch, and I'm, I, you know, you want to say something, but you don't want to. And finally, the third time I pass him, he gets up and he goes, oh, I, I want you to know I'm a very big fan of it. And I went, oh, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a night where I went, 
Hold, I, I, we got back in the car after this thing, and I went, we have stepped to the fucking looking glass. What just happened? Yeah. What was that? Right. I'm not in that club. That's not my club. You know, how did, what happened here? So it was, it was things like that that would, that would just kind of rock my world. But I got to tell you, I was never, never comfortable there. Right. Never comfortable there. I mean, I handle the crowds well, and I can go out, and I can schmooze, and I can do all that stuff. But I, I, it always freaks me out when I walk into a Hollywood room oh. and there's Hanks. You know, Marty Short's a friend. So you go to Marty's house and there's Hanks and Spielberg and Steve Martin. And, and I go, I want to go. I want to leave. <laughs> Can we leave now? I'm not good like them. I'm not funny. I don't want to get in a conversation. I don't, wanna, I don't know anything. I don't know anybody. I just let me go back home with my little friends. And the, I'm not bigger than life uh, like yeah, George I Costanza. Just, I can't. It's still, to this day, I get very uncomfortable with that whole thing. Yeah. Um... There's a part of me to this day, uh, after doing a number of motion pictures, I don't know exactly how many, 62. Uh, the first week on the set of anything, I wait for someone to tap me on their shoulder and say, we're we've sorry. made a horrible yeah, error. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We meant Kevin Spacey. Yeah. You're yeah. not supposed to be here. Right. And, but it's real. I get you know, it. It's funny, but it's real. I it's get it. There. I feel like a poser every time. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. Yeah, um, but but there in the, there is that moment also where you sort of register. I know I don't believe I belong, but they all treated me like I did, so that part is great. Whether I accept it or not right. is my own mishigas. But the trick then, do you find, is to not try and be what they think you you what you think they want you to be. That's impossible for me because I'm a people pleaser in my oh. DNA. So I immediately start dancing. See, I have to work really hard to not go, oh, okay, you're funny, uh, I'm funny too. Uh, you know, because uh, really, I'm much happier around funnier people just being the audience. Yeah. I'm very happy to be that. Yeah. But I always feel like, oh, okay, um, funny story, funny story, funny, funny. You, you know, it, my brain is, uh, yeah, it's working it. And also there's the, uh, a, a version of buyer's remorse. Mm -hmm. I'll have this ridiculous opportunity and then I'll end it because I don't feel adequate. <laughs> I'll end it prematurely and say, all right, well, I'm going to, yeah, all right, before I get dismissed, absolutely. I'll dismiss yeah. myself. You bet. And then on the walk over to wherever it is I think I'm going, I'll, I immediately am yelling at myself saying, seriously, you just ended a conversation with that person? You fuck it, you know. And... I guess you're right. It's good that we're, Steve we're all I'm at, I'm insecure. At Marty Short's house, Steve Martin, who's a god to me, comes over and, go, and says to me, Marty says you, you do magic. I love magic. Show me something. Oh. And I didn't do it. I didn't show him anything. And, I went, and then I went home and I went, the fuck is the matter? What am I, an idiot? I could have shown him one thing. Come on, even the if he's asked. seen it, if he, you know, he's just he's trying, like, he comes over, he's nice enough to start a conversation. You don't gotta be a dick and about I, it. And I blow him off. I'm going, oh my God, I'm such an idiot. I'm yeah. such an idiot. Oh my God. And also, we get invited to like people, big people's homes for dinner. Yeah. And these homes are fantastic, and the dinner is fantastic, and they're grown ups. And I'm like still 12, you know? And then. You know, I go, oh, okay, we'll get together. And we don't reciprocate for a year. And then it's too late. Yeah. And we don't get invited back yeah. anymore. And it's only because I was so fucking intimidated That's <laughs> and exactly overwhelmed right. by the experience. Yeah. Not because I wasn't, didn't have an amazing time. I just, I feel this big. I go, I, I'm not calling Kirk Douglas back <laughs> and asking him over for dinner. <laughs> you know, I can't do it. Right. I can't do it. It's funny. But it's, it's well... You, you needn't look any further for uh, for proof that w we are what we are. We can't. You bet. Yeah. I'm a little Jewish kid from Jersey. I want to invite them back in, so please uh, allow that because they do love to participate, and they are about 17 people. <laughs> um, at Cockamamie, one of our fave fans, oh, has sure. another T5 for you. All right. T5. Sorry, the T5. tradition continues. T5 forever now. <laughs> It's it. very catchy. That's going to wind up in a mashup. Pen or pencil? Pencil. Skittles or Starburst? Skittle. Bed sheets tucked or untucked? Untucked. <laughs> <laughs> Diamonds or hearts? Diamonds. 
Musicals or dramas? Musicals. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a half mo. My friend Steven Spinella called me a half mo. Not a whole mo. I'm a half mo. <laughs> I'm a giant Fleming homosexual right up until the actual sex. But then. <laughs> that is fucking brilliant. Yeah. Um, wow. Oh, another great one just came up. Oh. Sorry, we're going to an immediate T5 without the, oh. without the thing. T5! Yeah. Eva, fuck me. Okay. <laughs> okay. This one from at Patty Fritz. Oh, I love Patty Fritz. Uh, well, we just answered this, yeah. but I'll go ahead anyway. Stage, musical or drama? Musical. Beer or wine? Neither. Can or Krug? What? Can. Can. Oh. Come or on. Krug. Can. TV show or voice work? TV. Flutes or drums? Flutes. Let's talk about the high school marching band. Yeah. Jamie, what instrument you played the thing that, well, you said it wasn't really an instrument, but it was. What did you and, Ju and Jackie play? <laughs> I played percussion that required note reading, so like the xylophone or the glock. That requires was, reading? Yeah. What are you talking about? You gotta read notes. No, that's to play. what I mean. The, the, the percussion that required note reading. Oh. That's what I mean. Note a, reading. We yeah. heard note, note reading. Note reading. I thought you said reading. no reading. Yes, no, note because, reading. Yeah, no, all the other That's what I did as well, like, yeah. uh, eventually in the orchestra, yes. yeah. So any, so any yeah. of those instruments? And the chimes. Did, I loved uh, Christmas time because I got to play the chimes. Sure, yeah. That was the fun Absolutely. part. Absolutely. I, I got stuck on timpani more more often than not. Mm. That's a good it, one, though. Because, you know, tune it to F. Bum! Tune it to B flat. That was that. That, that was a great instrument. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's its own little cult, the marching band, the high school marching band. Talk about a yeah. peer group. Yeah. You, it's a very tight sect, I would think, as an outsider. No? Not in my no. high school. We had it like over 300 members. Holy crap. So, yeah. Of the band itself? Of the band, of the marching band. We, because our we band always went was on good trips. About, People uh, were in it for the trips. Right. <laughs> yeah, our band was only probably about 60, but when you add the, the flag girls and the whole thing, we probably. No, I'm just talking, probably, I'm talking instruments. You're talking instruments. Yes, yeah, no, we, we were a including. tiny little band, but we probably took the field with about 120, 140 people. Right. Of which the band was half. But I, I began as a flute player. So you got laid left and I right. I was a flower, oh yeah, big time. <laughs> I shoved the flute in my own ass. All that was, right. That was how I got laid. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Jeez, I keep circling back. Uh, I'm beside myself. I'm here and here. Um, yeah, I was a, I was a very, uh, <laughs> I was a flute player. That was, it's really good. It's good when you weigh 400 pounds and carry a flute. Uh -huh. it, it completes, You're sending out a message. It completes the ensemble <laughs> in a beautiful way. I never want to see naked vagina. <laughs> yeah. Does everyone notice this? That's my plan. This is my idea. Well, um, you break the stereotype it. from going with a tuba. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's because when I start, when you had to take an instrument in third grade, I had orthodontia from hell. Oh. I mean, if I went shh, blood, so <laughs> you couldn't do anything that. That you had to go, <laughs> that was no good, yeah. and nothing that went in the mouth, and so, and my, we couldn't afford a piano, my parents refused anything, percussion, I picked up a guitar, and my fingers, I think, were that big at the time, and I went, I can't, and so it was flute, mm -hmm. or violin, I and I went, I'm not, no, I said, no, yeah, well, no, that was not the reason I <laughs> shunned the violin, I thought, this is, how's this for thinking, the flute is more masculine there than the is. violin. There it is. That's, uh, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a studly instrument. Well, Ian Anderson. <laughs> it's phallic, and it's near my uh, mouth. That's right. Who's this going to fool? <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> folks in the audience at the Tony when you win? My folks, no. No. Uh, no. My wife was in the audience. They had disowned you at that point. My, my parents, uh, the, minute I'm, when the minute I said, uh, I've met the girl I'm going to marry, my wife, my parents went, terrific. Florida. And, uh, and, they, <laughs> and they relocated to Florida. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so, can't fathom, so please fill in some blanks for me. Because um, having been a nominee, uh, I do wave the flag of, well, I've made the final cut. Right. And I think the winner is a lottery thing. And it just happens out of happenstance of what the energy and the vibe is mm -hmm. leading up to it. And there's yep. a weird thing. So that's fine uh, one day maybe. But for me, the nomination is... So to stand there and accept the Tony Award, walk us through just a couple of seconds of that. Well, you must remember that being a gay man, mm -hmm. my little acceptance speech when I'm 12 years old in the bathroom, you know, accepting my award, it's not the Oscar, it's not the Emmy, it's the Tony. The Tony was the holy grail. And my honest thinking was, well, you're not getting to Broadway until you're 40. 
So maybe if you're lucky, by the time you're 70, they'll throw you a bone and give you like a nice try Tony, you know, mm -hmm. kind of thing. And at 29, they go, there it is. And I was not in my own body at the time. I mean, the truth is, I knew going into that night, it was a very, I wanted for, for being in a musical that year. It was a very bad year for musicals. Uh, I'm not being, How so? I, well, there just weren't many. I mean, usually there were five nominated musicals. They couldn't get five musicals to nominate that year. Now that's all there is. Well, yeah. I mean, now it's become a boon. But that year was very rough. And um, I was up against, there was only four actors in the category. Again, usually five or six in a category. So it's Tony Danza. So it's, uh, it's not Tony Danza. He would have won. Um, I was up against, uh, the show that I was in was a very heavy dance show. Uh, I was up against the star dancer of the show, uh, and then two guys from a show that had closed called Star Mites. One of them had played a lizard, and the other one I was, was a star mites. singing lizard. You right? were in Star Mites? Yes. Right? Who was the lizard? Remember the lizard? Yes. Yeah. Oscar Gladman was the lizard. Well, in, in your my, production, in my Oscar, production. <laughs> Oscar was in the big time production on Broadway. But I, uh, uh, I was and, uh, and I actually had a solo in that, and it was the only reason it was chosen was all this political hubbub, bub So, because it was like catered for the the girl whose like mother was on the school board, so that's why we had to do that. There you go. Because it was like because it was she was go. the lead. Nice. Look at that. Politics plays a role again. Yep. Well, it was two guys from Star Mites. Star Mites had closed, so I thought they're not really viable. So it's really between me and and this dancer, and I did think. This could be the year of the dancer, because the, the biggest show on Broadway was our show, and it was a dance show. So I thought, they'll celebrate the dancer. But, uh, but I knew it was literally a coin toss. It was going to be him or me. So I was kind of prepared, uh, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but it was still, it was, it was bizarre. But I will tell you that it was the rest of the evening that was the biggest growing thing. Because I always think, you know, when you win the thing you think you're going to win, well, the fireworks are going to go off, the world's going to love you, and the... the and I remember going home, and there were 10 messages on my machine. And I went, That's 10. 10. 10. Should have been like 100. Yeah. And I remember going to bed that night going, I guess that's it, huh? That's it. I guess that's it. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I, and I started to realize, more like a grown-up instead of like a kid, you know, this isn't really what you think it is. Right. It's nice. It's a nice thing. But it, it, in the big scheme of things, it's not... Not that big a deal, um, and it was. It, and I tell you, it, it came back to me again because I, I was nominated. I think I don't know how many times I was nominated for an Emmy for, for Seinfeld, but six. Six. Okay, never won it. But I think the second time I was nominated was the one year that I thought I could get this this year because I it's it, it had been a good year for me, and there was there were none of the um, you know the veterans that were always John Larroquette was yeah, done. Yeah, they were they're done with John, and I thought this could be my year, and my my. Oldest son was, I think, three or four at the time. And I didn't get it. And it's the first award up, so it's a long night. Yeah. You know, it's, a, it's a long night. And I go home, and he has made me, out of crumpled up paper and tape, oh, no. an award. Oh, no. And, you know, it dictated, it said, um, best dad in the whole universe award. Oh, my gosh. And I went, you know what? The guy that has the other one tonight can stuff it. Yeah. I got the winner. I got Holy the winner. God. And that one is on my, that's on the mantle. I, I never get rid of that. Oh, my God. But that's really what, what, uh, yeah. what sold it to me, that it's, it's it, it, you know, it'd be nice. It, it helps. I think it's a great negotiating tool, mm -hmm. you know. Well, yeah. But um, it, in, the, in the big scheme of things, oh, the, so work for, is, the work is the work is the work. For the 12-year-old that was in the mirror with the hairbrush yeah. uh, making the speech, yeah. it certainly fulfilled that it, it, wish it did. and that It destiny. absolutely did. Uh, it absolutely did. But maybe it, it should be personalized uh, for any future nominees. This show was going on for maybe two months before we made column one front page of the L.A. Times. The only way that someone in our business gets column one above the fold of the L.A. Times is if we rape or murder someone. <laughs> there are no show business stories in column no, one, that's ever. For sure. But it was this guy, and he p pushed a story about the Internet becoming real, and he got us on the front page. Yeah. I heard from seven people, mm -hmm. four of which read it online. Now, my question to you... Uh, you know, isn't it amazing, though, how everybody... You, there are people in our business who, you know, win a Tony Award, and, and the world opens up. And I, and I go, are they, maybe they're better 
people. Maybe they have more friends. Maybe they have more... Maybe they just do this better. I live a very small life, very small world. Um, and I always have. I mean, since I was that little six-year-old boy hiding in my room, that's the, I'm comfortable there. But I, I wonder if we are the norm, and, and it's an illusion for everybody else, or if there really are the people that, you know, the world just goes, Yeah! We're there with you, for you. We want to celebrate with you. I don't know. I don't know. I, 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 I kind of see people that I think are having that. Like, well, that yeah, nice. I think there's more of a fluke lottery nature to all of it yeah. than, uh, than you're allowing. Yeah. I used to, my phrase 15 years ago, before he became a reality show star, was Chachi's a millionaire. <laughs> and I would just chant Chachi's a millionaire. Because this 13 or whatever year old kid you walked onto you. a set of a, of a popular show and became a household name. For no real reason, based on Absolutely. any sort of uh, arguable talent. Absolutely. But Chachi's a millionaire. So just throw logic and justice out the window. You got it. And just, uh, yeah, and I th so I felt we were one of the first people who, t I knew him from the stand-up days, who, who pointed out, to me actually, um, God, way, I just had gotten to town, it was way, way, way before the TV show. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Mm -hmm. You're here. We just put a number on your back. It's a marathon. Mm -hmm. The key is to not stop running. Right. Absolutely right. He's a smart boy. Uh, as in return to call since. Sorry? <laughs> what happened? Uh, Davido, Bush Davido Buscemi Lane. Do you know what those three names have in common? Davido Buscemi Lane. No. Other than being three last names. Yeah. Nathan being the last. Yeah. Allegedly vying for George Costanza. Oh, bullshit. No way. You're not buying it? No way. Lane, maybe, because, you know, I got it. Uh, I initially got it off of being put on videotape in New York, so I'm sure Nathan came in. Buscemi? Maybe. Maybe. DeVito, was, wasn't he doing, he was doing Taxi already. Taxi, he was already on. You followed, no, you followed Cheers, so Taxi was done. Yeah. But Taxi had been established on the air. He was he was already directing Mama from the train, and you know and that too stuff. old is the point you're making to be. Uh, Jerry. But also too established to to you know he he had a whole. If he's coming back going, to TV, yeah. it's the Danny. DeVito I think show. the only reason yeah. he made this list probably is because the network thought we can get Devito. Oh, get Devito, and they sure. said to yeah. Seinfeld, if we can get Devito, yeah. you're taking him. And Jerry said, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever he said, yeah. and they made an offer to him, and Devito said, I'm, I'm having some cheese right now. <laughs> I can't take that call. Um, <laughs> It looks like cheese, anyway. <laughs> Boy, I love him now on the, uh, it's always Philadelphia. Funny. Oh, my oh, God. Man. What a revelation. He is a funny Such man. Such a troll on it. <laughs> He's, He's so perfect. That's his Twitter. Me, that's his Twitter thing, a troll, the troll, something the troll. Right. Uh, it's yeah. such a troll. Um, <laughs> I love it. Do we have time? Are you ready? I At the ready, sir. Okay. You told me to pick up your cake at 5.30. Let's That's do this thing. Did. Roll the intro. Did Who you tweeted? call them? Roll the intro. Are you ready yes, for I the did. game of Sweeping the Nation? Who tweeted? Who tweeted? Sammy. Who tweeted? Oh, good. No, they'll charge me. Don't worry about it, honey. Who Who's tweeted? Who's the good-looking fellow on the left there? Uh, well, he's standing right here. What Sammy? in the world? Oh. It's supposed to be me. Well, some of us, some of us do better by animation. <laughs> some of us, <laughs> some of us do not become light Egyptian number four. What is, <laughs> wait a second, but Duckman, we didn't get to talk about that. What would you like to say bit. about Duckman? Well, when, you, when she asked you about Another voice project work I got screwed out of. We were there before The Simpsons, before South Park, before all those guys. Sons of bitches. Bullshit. Yeah. Nothing. 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 One of my favorites. Yeah. Hey, so you got, you know, you, uh, you did work with Rob Reiner after A Few Good Men. Yeah, Philly. North. Yes, I did. On uh, North. Yeah. Yeah. Which was its generation's yeah. Joanna Man. <laughs> nice. So you guys have that in nice. common. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I'm yes, sorry. I've been waiting indeed. to say that all day. We've both been in a hurdle. <laughs> yeah. A yeah. speed bump in the director's <laughs> career. Yes, we have, Sam. <laughs> Go sit down. North was weird oh, because well. Julia Louis Dreyfus played his wife, and I was like, I don't like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not a lot of people got. <laughs> I'm like, could get behind. That, yeah. Did that weird you out? <laughs> yes. I was like, I can't get behind I gotta this. You want to hear a crazy quick story? Please. There's a moment in that film where somehow uh, Julia and I have gone into a permanent coma, a yes. rigid coma, and we're on display. We're being revealed in a display case at the Smithsonian. So we went down to some big museum here in town, and they have us, you know, kind of like on these little gurneys, these upright gurneys in this display case, draped, and there's, a, you know, hundreds of extras, and, and I go to Julia, 
How about if Naked? how about if when they do this, I'm just I'm just fucking your balls out, just just <laughs> flat out. She went, let's go for it. <laughs> and I dropped her out, and she's got her skirt up, <laughs> and they pull this thing off. And there you go. It's good for me. Now, how do you feel about it? <laughs> would you have ever recovered from that visual? I, that would be quite if you a had thing, been one it? of the people walking by. I believe the words you're looking for are "worlds are colliding." Worlds yes, are colliding. Worlds are colliding. <laughs> That's right. I'm becoming George. All right, now, Sammy. What who you, tweeted? Here we go. Who, who you, tweeted? What do you so, got uh, for You and I discussed the game before. Yes, indeed. Uh, I understand quick the reminder. Yeah. So uh, I will read You'll the tweet, retweet. and then you buzz in. You buzz in by saying your first name. My first name. Yep. All right. And then I'm going to point to you. You're going to have three seconds to say Tyra, Paris, or Demi, who wrote that tweet that I just read. Right here. And uh, you get it right, you get five points. Right. You get it wrong, you lose three. There's a penalty for a wrong answer. That's right. right. And, you're okay. not, and like I said before, you're not playing for uh, shiggles. What are we playing for? 20 US hey, look dollars. Look at that. What the hell? Look a dancing at Jackson? That. A dancing Jackson. Look at that. Watch him dance. Come on, you bastard. Nothing? Nothing. Nice. Nah. Not enough air conditioning no. for next week. There That's he goes. It. All right. It's actually blowing on my left nipple, <laughs> oh, which can dance for you if you'd like to. And also the name of your second book. That's right. <laughs> tweet number one. The original title of My Left Foot. Oh. Go ahead, sorry. No, it's quite all right. There's tweet no number one. Switch. It's crazy how everyone texts now, and calling a friend is becoming... Jason! Tyra. That is correct. Whoa! Off to it. Right out quick. of the gate, he's screaming. Quick lead. Thank Holy you shit! You might have uh, you might have your She used a three-syllable word. I think she, well, to me, might be able to use a three-syllable word. <laughs> Tweet number two. Wow. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Went costume shopping with my love today. Found so many Kevin, great. Take, to me. Incorrect. What? Who's out of my love? Ms. Hilton. Bullshit. Ooh. I would have said to me, I'm glad you beat me to that. She's wow. got some. I'm glad you beat me. She has a penis she's spinning on. It's hardly my love. <laughs> <laughs> Minus three. Did that come out of me? Did you hear that? It's fine. Yeah, it's fine. All right. Tweet number three. Yes. Went for a jog this morning and now just finished working out. What are your Jason. favorite? Tyra. Ooh, sorry. Oh. Welcome back to my world. That's probably to me then. That's got to be to me. Paris. Paris, really? Paris. See, they're, they're I'm tricky. Shocked. They're not easy. I'm they shocked. They're not as easy as you I'm think. Shocked. And by the way, with that, I, I just be on that realized, Coke diet. without even thinking about it, this whole time when someone gets a wrong answer, that's my reaction to Moops Moors. Oh, sorry, no. It's I've been doing that the really? whole time I've been doing this game. Oh. And it, it took you sitting here for me you to see, realize to that's jog, what I've been doing. To jog it into Thank your, you. You're so welcome. Nice. Tweet number four. Interesting new Kevin. concept. <laughs> <laughs> to me. Yeah. <laughs> I did the math. I know we you did. We kept guessing I know you did. You did the geometry, right? That's right. <laughs> That's Celebrity cheating. Celebrity geometry. That well, you're tied, gents. <laughs> you're now tied. All right. It's a four-answer game now. Tweet number five. I'm reading a book right now where a lot of the people... <laughs> I need three more guesses. <laughs> There's a lot more. There's more to this. There's more. There's more. Wow. Reading a book right now where a lot of the P's are capitalized, and I don't know why. Hell! <laughs> book called A Much Married Man. Jason. Uh, to me. Ooh, I'm afraid not. Oh. Tyra. 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 See, you take a chance at something. Why? Yeah, you gotta <laughs> just let it sit there. <laughs> I, That's what I do. I, I rush like in, the gumption. I rush in headstrong, and I no, just, no. I pay. It's fine. I pay for it. Still anyone's game. I like the gumption because I was lost yep. and out to sea. Tweet number six. Whew. Anyone's game. Celebrating this year's glamour real moments, directorial debuts of three amazing women Jessica Beale, Eva Mendez, and Rachel Weiss. Great work, ladies. Kevin Tyra. No. Incorrect. We're no, tied it's again. Me. It's to me. It's it is, me. in fact, to me. We're yeah, tied you know, again. Because, because oh, wow. I should have known that, because to me is connected. Ava Mendez just directed a little short film that I was asked to possibly do, and I knew Demi Moore was in the mix there somewhere, mm. and she would have tweeted about Ava Mendez. Look at that. It's all coming Insider together. Insider information. It's all coming together. I, I might have saved myself a little bit by answering incorrectly instead of losing five more points. That was a defensive move. Wow, that part. was. All right, now it's an even game move. again. All right. It is. All right. You are it's tied on. at negative one. Right. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> look at look, the look, smart look ass got SAT and math. <laughs> Tweet number seven. 
I'm trying to whip my hair like Willow Smith, but my hair is slicked back in a bun, so I guess I'll whip my neck. Jason, I'm going with the reference to Willow Smith, so I'm gonna say. Three seconds. Tyra! <laughs> Cause they're all black! <laughs> that is correct! Yes! <laughs> oh my gosh! For once, your racism well, served you. That's right. This is fantastic what's going on here. Nothing. I love good old so fashioned family get this You right. have to get this one this right. Oh, and I can just sit back. That's true. All right. You could just sit back. Keep in mind, if you rang in and got it wrong, you'd still win. That's but right. I'm just saying, let's give Kevin a shot. I'm Tweet. not going to answer. I'm going to allow you to answer. Number I eight. want this to be fair. All right. All right. Just went and saw Jackass 3D. So hysterically funny at times, so gross it made me nauseous. But loved it! Kevin to me. Uh, uh. We have a winner, Mr. Uh, Jason uh, Alexander! Oh, that, that, that was Paris, Paris. Hilton! That was Paris, yeah, that was Paris. That wow. had to be Paris. I couldn't possibly no accept. No <laughs> With this winner Thank right there. Thank you, Sammy. That is how you play Who Tweeted. Wow, Nicely well done, done, Very sir. strong. Very well done. Very strong. <laughs> Not since celebrity who banged a millionaire. Right? <laughs> um, wowie wow. Wowie wow wow. Sir, we're just coming under the two hour mark and I want to tell you, uh, well first I'll ask you, can you believe that much time flew by? What I can't believe is that you brought up Holly Hunter and that I lived with her and didn't ask any of the obvious questions. No, that I is, I shows great restraint on I your wouldn't. part. I wouldn't. And also, you kind there of announced from the beginning she wouldn't have sex with me, so I just well, left the true. rest of it alone. She wouldn't have much of anything with me. <laughs> I see what you're saying. I am a Jew, and she is from the South. So. <laughs> Did she try to lynch you? <laughs> <laughs> is that what that was? Yeah. I, I thought it was just something just a rope wrap on a around tree. the bathrobe. Yeah, <laughs> uh... um, can't thank you enough, but quickly tell me, or not quickly, but oh, please tell me. It has been sitting here ready for plugging at all times. Please tell me about this, because it's, uh, I, I wanted to dance all around it, uh, all around yes. the career today. Yes. And this is the, the Danny this is the thing Donnie that's, Clay uh, exper uh, Saving me from poverty. This, uh, this was, um, uh, you have had, you see, well, I, see, what I admire about you and Jerry and stand-ups and is that in some ways you, you own your career because when the chips are down, you can go, screw everybody. I, I'm writing I'm going to I'm writing 10 minutes and I'm going out and doing my thing. Yeah. And I never had that. I could do it as a singer, but once, once Seinfeld actually established itself, you know, you go, George Costanza's coming to sing show tunes today. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big night. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to have something I could, that I could kind of own and control. And my friend Peter Tilden and I, um, Great writer. Oh, funny man. He said, we had done it, he had created a show for me called Bob Patterson about a motivational speaker. And, you know, and it was a short lived show, but we had a blast playing in that turf. And he said, do you remember how we used to do like little two minute motivational seminars as Bob for the O&Os and for the right. station guys? And he said, wasn't that fun? I said, yeah, that was fun. The, the, the sitcom element didn't work so great, but the, that stuff was fun. He said, Why don't we do that. You're getting invited by all these corporations. Why don't we do? You'll go in, you motivate them, you're going to make them better. So he and I created Donnie Clay, America's fourth leading motivational speaker. Genius. A member of the, uh, the Society for Human Motivational Understanding and Knowledge, which anagrams down to schmuck. And, um, and, and that's what we do. So it, it, Donnie is, it's a comedy show with a little bit of music, but it's very interactive and somewhat improvisational with the audience premise is that you've come to have this life-changing motivational seminar with someone who is really not uh, equipped to deliver it. And it's, it's stand-up with a theatrical premise. Right. I don't have the, the thing that would make me crazy is to, uh, is to go, Jason Alexander, stand-up comic! <laughs> I would just go and go, I'm sorry, I've got nothing, I've got nothing, I don't know how to do this. But this is, is just enough theater to it right. and a character that I, I go out and I have a blast. So we, uh, we played Vegas last year for a month, had a great time. We're going to go month. back, uh, going back to the MGM Grand, uh, November 4 through 10 and do the show again. And you know, uh, it, it's one of those things that's taking on a real life and uh, I would say so. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's and it's fun to do. It's just fun to do, and you can book it anywhere. And Had you do done a one man thing before? I'd done one man plays, you right. know, but not not something like this. It's it's a boy. It's a thing. I yeah. gotta tell you, my this show is uh, eighty minutes, you know, and it's you hit the you hit the forty five minute mark and go shut the fuck up, you know. I'm so tired of hearing my own voice at that point. But that's it's, never uh, happened to me before. 
Oh man, it's uh, just it's a blast to do. It yeah. really is a blast to do. So, Donnie Clay, the Donnie Clay experience. MGM Grand in Vegas. The dates are November fourth, fourth through ten, through the tenth, fourth through ten. Glad you've got nothing to do. That's Come coming on up now. next Dude, week. I'll you right 10th. in. I'll comp you right in. That's coming up next week. We move into a new home. Where are you going? Give everyone the address. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we will be at seventy-two forty-one Laker Street. Oh, that's lovely. Uh huh. Where's that? Free Fake Street. <laughs> One, two, three, fake street. <laughs> hey, Teeny, you know where fake street is? <laughs> See? You got the same hat as me. Yeah, we got the same hat. <laughs> you do a lovely job. This is a lovely uh, venture for you. You had I a good like experience? It. it was very, very nice. It flew right by. It did. It's a conversation. It was a conversation. Not since Charlie Rose. There you go. <laughs> Have I had this Couple kind more of great fun? Charlie and I actually had a lovely chat. We, he was asking me about the Seinfeld negotiation, the big Seinfeld negotiation, because right. we were right in the middle of that. And he was going to, you know, pull me down to size, and I fooled him. <laughs> How'd you fool him? Because I was able to tell him things he didn't, ex he didn't anticipate. We, ha I had a, we had a reasoning behind it all. Right. Do you remember that whole thing? We were asking for a million dollars an episode, and then the NBC was trying to smear us in the, in the papers, and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And Charlie was trying to call you on the carpet? Charlie, you know, Charlie, you got a minute? Yeah. And Charlie said, um, <laughs> let me ask you a question. Uh, you know, do you think anyone should be making a million dollars? A week? A week for being on television? I said, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I said, a, a, a school teacher is lucky if they make 50000 a year, a cop is making 35000 a year, I should be making a million dollars a week? Absolutely not. It's ridiculous. But the show generates $14 million of profit a week for the network, and it has been sold into syndication for over a billion dollars. Billion. I didn't put that money there. I didn't ask anybody to put it there. But it is sitting there. Someone's got to take it. Who should get it? Who should get it? And Charlie said... I said, so did, did Julia and Michael and I, did we have any... Were, whatever percentage of the success of the show you think we are, if you apply that percentage to a billion dollars... And he went, well... <laughs> I said, okay, there's our case. He went with and, I the, also, and I also said, and I told him a story about how the head of the network, when we said a million dollars, came down to the set, and we had a never very nice relationship. And Warren Littlefield and I talk about this all the time. And he said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, are you serious? And I said, yeah, we're dead serious. We know it's there. We're dead serious. They won't, they won't give us any points of syndication, so we got to take it in salary. I said, but if you want to be serious, serious, if I were you, I wouldn't make this deal. This is a bad deal for television. It's no good. Because if you give us a million dollars a week, the guys on ER are going to ask for a million five. And the guys in Friends are going to ask for two. And then, then the next guy and the next guy. This, this is a very bad thing to do. Holy shit. But we're dead serious. We're not going to come back and do this show for pennies on the dollar when no one... I said, there's no point in that. I'm going to be stuck being George Costanza the rest of my life. Can I get, can I get a payday? <laughs> <laughs> if not now, when? Yeah. So that was the conversation. But that, that was, you know... And ultimately, NBC decided to... We, we finished, I can talk about it because it was all over the press, all you have to do is Google it, but we, we got to 600,000 and everybody got nervous and... You caved? We caved. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, it, it, look, it turned out very well. But, yes. but that, was, that was a really dicey time. That was yeah. an unpleasant time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I had that in your dossier and I, I, um, I make audible calls along the way and I thought really you're gonna try to snore him for some financial Absolutely. news sure and I'm, I'm glad you shared it because no it's an it's an it's an important thing and what was interesting you're right though it is Google it, it, it is out it's, it's there. all out there yeah. so you know I'm not giving away I, I would certainly wouldn't do that to Michael and Julia if it wasn't out there but um, but what was interesting about it is I remember as it was ongoing, and there really was, I don't know if it was on purpose, but there was a real kind of public campaign to kind of make the three of us look like greedy Absolutely there was. bastards. How dare they? That's right. Jerry gave them jobs. Right. Oh, did he? Yeah. And I remember being online at a movie theater in New York on 86th and Broadway. Yeah. And this little Hispanic woman, you know, with two kids came over to me and she went, you, want that social, you, you, you do that Seinfeld show. I said, yeah, she said. And you're asking for all that money. You're asking for all that money. I said, yeah, yeah, we are. And I'm ready for her to go, who the fuck do you think you are? You know, I'm ready. And she goes, you stick it to him, baby. You stick it to him. <laughs> and I went, wow. Oh, all right. Fantastic. <laughs> the people are behind us. You, yeah. know, uh, you know, somehow she, she 
we had made our case well enough that she understood. So yeah, uh, it's nice. Well, I heard Jerry say it himself, so this is certainly not speaking out of school, that in the cast, he was the weak link in terms of who had to deliver every week uh, beyond... On, on the acting side, yes. Uh, yeah, sure. exactly. Yeah. Um, again, I'm quoting him. These yeah. Are, so, uh, yeah, there was a sense for people who loved the show, in her case, and from a business standpoint, for those of us allegedly in the know of, you're going to pay them every fucking dime. Because there is no that without them. Yeah. Um, well, I can't thank you enough for spending this time with us. I've had a delightful time. You're not off the hook. I gave you a, a, a You want the 20 back, don't you? You want the 20 back? No, no. I know. The, oh, I'll no. never get to the car. I won't. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tackle you on the way out. <laughs> and I'll get my own arm busted for it. But, um... This is your camera for your version of the Larry King game. Shall we go over the rules again for All right, you? Give me, the, give me the rules of the Larry All King. Right. It's that moment that Larry shares something on the air. So right. it's not you about yourself. Mm -hmm. I want you to be Larry and as Larry share mm -hmm. something about Larry that none of us want to know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's that on the other moment where he's about to go to the phones and he says, I like to this and none of us want to hear what he's about to say. It's mm -hmm. that moment. So it's the bad Larry King impression. Right. Don't worry about a good one. We want right. a bad one. Larry revealing something about himself, and then go to the phones. Mm -hmm. and when you go to the phones, if the name of the city is funny sounding, it doesn't hurt. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. There's your camera. Mm -hmm. 45 All right. seconds. All right. On a brief side note to the makers of Fungigel. Fung I can't pronounce that word. Fungigel. Fungigel. Uh, there really should be some notification on the side of the box that when you, uh, when you perform cunnilingus on a woman that's got a yeast infection, uh, there really, there's, a, there's not only an odor, there's a, there's a nutty flavor there. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not something that's, I'm not saying unpleasant. Not to this guy. Not to a guy who's been in the trenches like me. I went down on Hillary Clinton, I can go down on anything. <laughs> What's the difference between going down on Hillary Clinton and a bowling ball? If you had to eat a bowling ball, you could do it. But I want to say to the makers of Funger Gel, whatever the hell that's called, a little more warning on the side of the box. We're out to Mini Ha Ha New York! <laughs> <laughs> there it is! Uh, why did I pick Hillary Clinton? A lovely woman. I like Hillary Clinton. I can't. Bella Abzug. Make that Bella Abzug. <laughs> I can't believe you went there, Sergeant, but I'm, right, I'm behind you all the way up the top of that hill. Uh, thank you so much to our guest, Jason Alexander, God ladies bless. and gents. God bless. All right, sit there uncomfortably. I can't feel I've hurt that man. I can't. Uh, no, I no, just... no. Dr. Chen will never be the same before you got here. All right. Um, uh, sit there uncomfortably for 90 seconds or so right. while I wrap things up, please. All right. All right. Uh, I can't thank you all enough. Hope you're having a lovely uh, Halloween uh, after the show. Uh, I want to thank my crew for coming in here and working during a weekday. God forbid they come in and it's not Sunday. Um, so I do want a special thanks all to each and every one of you. And uh, the crew, speaking of which, has been working uh, low these last uh, a couple of hours while we've been chatting in here comfortably. I wonder what they've been up to, if only there was some sort of so to be visual. Continued. We had a to be continued yeah, previously on. Kenny Sam. It's a pumpkin instead of a head. Excuse me. Oh, and now the conclusion. Oh, oh hi, hey, Corey. Corey. Hey, guys. Here for the pumpkin carving. Awesome. Some hey, what's with the hunt? It's a little chilly, huh? Oh, you can set it down right there. Oh, no! Oh, no! Oh, sweet. That's helpful. Thanks, Emily. Someone get the lights. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. They did a double whammy on us. I thought it was going to be yet another to be continued. They thank froze. Thank God then, it's uh, not. Oh, thank God it's I over. I can't handle the suspense. <laughs> thank God. I was having, I need another more palpitations. All right. Uh, next week, the, uh, the Bradley Whitford, followed by the Joel McHale. The hits, they just keep coming. We've got them lined up. Don't go away. Keep coming back. We love that you're watching, honestly, or listening, if that's the case. And it certainly is these days at a very, very large number, and thank you for that. Um, sorry for all the plugging at the beginning of the show, but a lot of things came together at the same time. So there you have it. Uh, until next week, and as always, get out of my face. He's all of the rainbows, but not of the rain. He's dry, but he's an alcoholic. 
He's scared.